thought that our governor and uh, his competitor in the, the recent governor's race, Chris Peterson and, and uh, Spencer Cox, set a really good example for us. So here's just a 30 second clip. I'm Chris Peterson and I'm Spencer Cox. We are currently in the final days of campaigning against each other to be your next governor. And while I think you should vote for me, yeah, but really you should vote for me, there are some things we both agree on. We can debate issues without degrading each other's character. We can disagree without hating each other. And win or lose in Utah, we work together. So let's show the country that there's a better way. My name's Chris Peterson. And I'm Spencer Cox. And we, we approve this message. And I, I just thought that was such a cool thing. It actually made national news um, because there weren't too many uh, red and blue candidates standing in the same screen together. Um, and even getting as close as they did um, and speaking nicely to one another. Um, Scott, may I just add that I heard about this at uh, national state boards. They had picked uh, up on it and were so impressed with what came out of Utah. Oh, thank you. Um, I'll just go over this quote really quickly. When people say things that we find offensive, civic charity asks, that we resist the urge to attribute to immorality or prejudice views that can be equally well explained by other motives. It asks us to give the benefit of doubts, the assumption of goodwill and the gift of attention. When people say things that agree with or respond thoughtfully to our argument, and we praise what's, whatever we can legitimately find praiseworthy in their beliefs and their actions, when we argue with a forgiving affection, we recognize that people are often carried away by passions when discussing things of great importance to them. We overlook slights and insults and decline to respond in kind. We apologize when we get something wrong or when we hurt someone's feelings, and we allow others to apologize to us when they do the same. When people don't apologize, we still don't hold grudges or hurt them intentionally, even if we feel that they've Sure, Hans, your mic went off. You might want to turn off your camera to see if the sound will come it's in. A sense, or a sense or sense of worth. We never forget that our opponents are human beings who possess innate dignity and fellow citizens who deserve respect. Um, I um, I'll get out of this. And you can drop the screen sharing. I think now that's what I had. Are we back to where you can see me? <laughs> okay. Um, I think we have a really a great um, freedom here in this country to be able to speak our minds um, in political realms and education. I lived in Thailand for a while and they still have less majesty laws on the books. Now, if you speak badly about the king, uh, that was one of the first things that the kind of foreigner training that we went through with my company was to make sure that we didn't do anything like that because you can end up in jail and it happens frequently. Um, so with that great freedom, I think comes great responsibility for us to be civil and to respect one another. Um, and I hope that as we, as we work out all these things and try to figure out what's best for education in Utah, that we can set an example for our children. That we can do things that would make them proud um, if they saw us and the way that we interact with one another. So that being said, um, I believe that we do have some public comment. In fact, we have a lot of public comment today. Um, we have 10 people, Patty, is that right on the calendar? Yes, we have 10 people. Okay, and we do have a lot of work to do today and we have to limit time. And so I think we're gonna give each of the 10 people And Chair Hansen, I think your microphone went out again. You might want to try and turn off your camera and see if that works. I think we might have lost Chair Hansen. Um, so what, what he was going to be saying as he's um, coming back into the room is that each participant will be given 90 seconds. Norley Green will be timing this. We do appreciate all of your time and efforts in joining the meeting and coming for public comment and realize that your time is valuable. Uh, we have a packed agenda, therefore the, the 90 seconds will be adhered to. Norley Green does not like to be the one to say, I'm sorry, your time is up, so please don't take it personally, but she'll say it to everyone who gets to be that time. 
So um, we apologize in advance if it's not enough time to say what needs to be said, but it, the agenda that that's about what we're going with. So um, as we move forward, I wanted to just wait while uh, we can get Chair Hansen back in the room. Patty? Patty board, yeah, board member Bell now, Patty, comment. Um, thank you. Um, I just wanted to make a comment too that, that if they have other things, they could send it to us if they had other information that they'd like to share. I just wanted to say hi to Senator Jackson too. I see you on here. Patty, are you um, texting him? I saw your mouth. Yes, I am. Have we? Oh, there there's, we... there's Scott. Yeah. Scott, you might want to turn your video sure. off. So we get better. Yeah, I think we, we had a glitch when we went from the sharing back, and I will turn the video off for a second while we're doing public comment, but I'm right here with you. Okay, okay. and sure, Hanson, we let them know about the 90 seconds or the minute and a half. Um, equal to the same and that they could send in anything that is um, that they didn't get time to say to the full board and that will be passed along. So um, Nora Lee has that list. Chair Hansen, if you'd like to call upon the first member for public comment. Yeah, please. I think we have, um, let's see, McKinley Withers is first on the list. Are you here, McKinley? I sure am. And I just quickly shared my screen because I want to be as efficient as possible. Um, so when does my time start? Right now. Okay. So uh, I just wanted to talk about a tool that we've used for mental health screenings called Terrace Metrics. Um, oftentimes we can think about mental health as this dark fog kind of settling in on our community and the purpose of our mental health screenings that we have now done for over 300 families in our district uh, is to help dispel the fog and help them see a little bit more clearly and feel empowered about what they can do uh, to support their, the students, uh, uh, their children, and for their families to find success in a, a difficult world. So, uh, really, when we planned our mental health screenings, we asked ourselves this big question, for whom? For whom are we doing this screening? And at the end of the day, our answer is so that students and their families can walk away feeling empowered, that they have tools within their tool belt that they can use uh, to find success in, like I said, a difficult world um, and to dispel that fog. So I'm going to skip our data, uh, but why we chose Terrace Metrics, which I understand this committee may have a chance to approve our continued use uh, of this tool, is it's not diagnostic. It's designed for the school setting. It offers support and information to empower families in the reports. It already uses, it uses already approved tools to deprive. That is time. Uh, okay, well, uh, I will be in touch. Please reach out if you have further questions about what we like to do with our mental health screenings. Uh, and McKinley, you. if you want to flash that last, okay, we're all right. Thank you. Appreciate it. Chair, this is Board Member Earl. If he wanted yes. to send that in an email to us, we could look through it. Yeah, so, certainly could. Um, yeah. And McKinley, we'll let you wind down at the 90 seconds. So if you want to show us that last slide, we'll, we can see that quickly. Okay. <clears throat> okay. So that's, that's, why we chose it, you can turn off or on any of the indicators in the report. And I just, I have a couple of sample reports uh, just so that you could see. The reason we chose this tool is a parent, we never know what kind of follow-up a parent might get in that okay. mental health screening event. So uh, okay. them having more information that is empowering was better. Uh, when we consider the question for whom or the purpose of why we're doing it. 
Um, so you can click any of the indicators and it gives additional tips and tools for anything that's on the report, but you can turn off and on any of the indicators uh, okay. when we use this tool. So wind up there, but thank you very much. And as um, board member Rill said, if you can send that to us, we'll take a closer look at it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, we have um, Curtis Linton. And after Curtis, Jim Larkin is, is on deck. Well, Curtis, are you here? Looks like maybe no Curtis. Um, Jim, are you here? Chair Hansen, might I uh, uh, just for a moment? Um, I've been told that the, the the board standard is two minutes, and so it looks like that's what we gave our first speaker. So the following speakers, in line with um, what we do in practice for these board uh, committees, will give two minutes as well. No, oh, that's fine. Okay, if there's a standard, we'll follow it. Yes. Okay, so Curtis, don't see Curtis. Um, do we have Jim? Jim Larkin. And I'm scrolling up and down the participants list and don't see him. Um, next would be Alvin Jackson with Tiffany Rees on deck. Alvin, are you here? Yes, I'm here. I'm here. Can everyone hear me? Great. We can. Please okay. go ahead. All right. Thank you. I'm grateful for the opportunity to speak today. My name is Al Jackson. Thank you for your individual and collective service as I know that you're all there to help create an environment in the Utah State School System that is conducive for all students to learn and grow. My wife and I currently have only two children at home, one of which attends high school in the Alpine School District, and he's loving his experience there as he's found the teachers and administrators to be kind and devoted to his academic progression. Today, the topic of race has once again taken center stage, and I know that many of you on the school board are motivated by good intentions and desire a safe environment for all students to learn, particularly those of color and those are, that are socioeconomically challenged. I invite you to consider programs and policies that invite diversity, unity, and belonging, and to avoid terms such as oppressed, oppressor, supremacy, anti-racism, et cetera. The very idea of one group being labeled as an oppressor or a supremacist actually denotes racism as the assumption is made that one race is, race is superior to another. That creates division and contention. And it also indicates that one group needs to change their behavior for the benefit of another group. In my opinion, that automatically builds in an excuse to fail. And to there's nothing more lethal than to tell a child or give a child an excuse to fail to tell that child that they're not agents of their own uplift is detrimental to their personal development. It's my hope we can focus on the victories that are possible, which are aspirational, as opposed to the injuries to be avoided. And again, I invite you to implement programs and policies that inspire our young people to be the best that they can be. It's the principles associated with diversity, unity, and belonging that are universal as they transcend race, gender, and culture. Thank you so much for your time. Okay. Thank you. Um, we next have Tiffany Reese. Tiffany, are you here? Yeah, I'm here. I was just turning my camera on. Okay. All right. Uh, Go ahead. Okay. As parents, we believe equity should be about opportunities for access to ad access to education. It shouldn't limit any groups and should always focus on equality of opportunity. As long as different individuals put forth different levels of effort, there will always be different outcomes. Any training that the Utah State Board of Education does needs to be around unity, civility, solutions-based. It needs to um, not disparage others and which means we shouldn't be putting down others and always need to focus on building students up. Training should come from the Utah laws and policies, not political ideologies or special interest organizations or outside groups. It should always allow free expression of ideas without judgment. Let's remember that intellectual debate 
should be valued, not demonized or canceled like so many do today. A University of North Carolina survey resulted in nearly 60% of conservatives self-censor in the classroom. Trainings and curriculum should always be approved by the local board through proper channels. It should always be accessible to parents to view. The trainings and curriculum should be simple. The local district should be determining it. And the curriculum should never be mandated. Some of these trainings are controversial because they undermine a cult, undermine what is being taught in the home and a culture and the culture of someone in someone's home. In an article about education, quote, how Manchester Proud could be eliminating equality for students by Anne Banfield, the following is stated, equality was considered a good thing until recently. With the equity movement, we are seeing a trend where opportunities to succeed va vanish all in the name of elevating students who have ran into barriers or, or are marginalized. Under the current education model where competency-based ed is introduced, the focus becomes on closing the achievement gap. We are seeing this played out by bringing the top down in order to achieve equity in outcome. The, they achieve equity by taking away opportunity for all students, even the marginalized. Fine. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Tiffany. Um, and we'll move now to Janet Eyring to be followed by Kevin Giddens. Uh, hello, um, thank you for allowing me to speak today. <clears throat> My name is Dr. Jan Eyring, Emerita Professor and former Chair of the Department of Modern Languages and Literatures at Cal State Fullerton, and now a Highland resident. I've been involved in teaching or training teachers of English as a second language for 40 years, starting first in Utah, working as a tutor for migrant uh, migrants, then teaching diverse students in California at all levels. I sent you a message yesterday with my position on equality, equity <clears throat> in Utah schools and anti-racism and bias training. I was born in Berkeley at the height of the civil rights movement and have great respect for diverse people and to providing equal opportunities to all people as our constitution guarantees. So I'm now asking myself the same question you're probably asking, how did a peaceful movement of change, improvement and legal equality led by Pastor Martin Luther King get hijacked by a radical violent movement of social justice in Utah and in the nation? Cynical theories by Pluck, Rose and Lisney uh, succinctly explains the root of critical race theory in postmodern theories that initially were just philosophical, but later and more recently have been operationalized by social justice warriors. If I could put their thesis in a nutshell, postmodernism is not dead. It has morphed into philosophies that are destabilizing this nation through social justice warriors. And these warriors for a large part are a growing number of our teachers and professors at the university who no longer teach objectively to make students aware of all sides of an issue, but indoctrinate our children and adults in the superficial diversity of identity politics, but not diversity of opinion. And unfortunately, they're supported by corporations, media, public figures, and the general public because these educators have served as their researchers, trainers, publicists, and consultants. Dr. John McWhorter, world-renowned black linguistics professor in his new book, The Elect, um, he calls this the new movement. Time third wave anti-racism has become a religion and in final conclusion, really not the religion of Utah, which uh, God fearing family oriented people who believe in reality, objectivity of science, the individual and the reality of truth live. Uh, I, I, I applaud your efforts to look into this theory and try to stop its spread in Utah. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jenna. Um, we'll move next to Kevin Giddens and he'll be followed by Aaron Bullen. Kevin, are you here? Yes, I am. Can you see and hear me? Um, yes. Jones Giddens, it says on your screen, I believe. Yes. Is that the right one? Okay. Correct. Kevin Jones Giddens. Thank you for this opportunity. I'm with Dub Utah, Diversity, Unity, and Belonging for Utah. Uh, I just want to share four solutions, principles that should go along with any initiative that uh, I, I suggest that we work on as a state. One is that the solution needs to incorporate administrators and teachers, community, parents, and students. Solutions that isolate any one of these would be exclusive. So again, teachers, administrators, solutions that go along with community, solution that goes along with parents, and students. 
Also, I want to focus on intellectual friction, not social friction. Anytime we base a training around social friction, political or social issues, it's going to lead us down the wrong direction. Harvard has done studies to say that diversity training does not work. And the reason why diversity training does not work is people are focused on race and protected classes instead of solutions. Diversity is not an outcome. We utilize diversity to get to an outcome. An outcome is belonging. An outcome is unity. An outcome is higher test scores for students. So whatever the solution is, make sure it's outcome-based. Also, solutions need to be focused on principles and not values. I agree with most of the dialogue that has been said today that we need to avoid political, being reactive to political or social issues. We should be focused on those principles that lead us forward. Principles like instilling trust, principles like accountability, principles like value and differences. And finally, as we focus on these principles, it will lead us to a unified outcome. Again, diversity should not be focused on race, gender, or protected for class. Diversity and inclusion should be focused on skills, competencies that lead us towards a common outcome. Thank you. Appreciate your thoughts today. Um, I think next we have Aaron Bullen and then Jessica Fivash will be on deck. Aaron? Hi, my name is Aaron Bullen and I am a parent of three children in the Utah public school system. I speak in opposition to the proposal uh, of the Access Advisory Committee to implement new anti-racist trainings in the state education system. Any uh, training implemented should be done at the district level and not mandated by the state. Uh, Utah Ed staff do not want or need another district uh, professional training session. It takes more time, which the teachers do not have. It takes time from the students, which do not get enough. And it gives them another training that costs money in staff, location, and lunch provided. Money that should not be going to the administrative body for this purpose. When the state decides to go through a very involved process of adding more training, it is usually for a very specific outcome that we wish to achieve. The claim being made is that this training is needed because of various racial disparities in student achievement. Not only do these claims ignore convoluting factors such as family income level and situation, but they assume without evidence that the entire Utah education system is systemically racist, which is offensive to me and my wife who is a teacher. And that, if we could only make our teachers, administrators and support staff less racist, we would achieve better outcomes for these students in need. Do we think this training will fix racial disparities in education outcomes? It will not. Do we think that it will increase rise proficiency or ACT scores for students of color? Of course not. There's not even a mechanism that we understand that this would supposedly happen. Our students need our help. Students of color are especially in need of our help. And if, we're in, if we were smart, we would actually address specific problems with real solutions. If students' parents are too busy working two jobs to make ends meet, uh, to help their students succeed, then we can target struggling students with tutors. No one is opposed to anti-harassment training. No one should be targeted for their intrinsic characteristics and made to feel unwelcome at school. I assume that our districts and our schools have already implemented anti-harassment training. Most every organization with an HR department has. If this training specifically needs to be bolstered, that then we do fine. it that way. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron. Um, next, we'll have Jessica Fivash and then Linda Isom will be our concluding commenter. Go ahead, Jessica. Hi. Hi, I'm multitasking. Thank you for taking my comment. And I come today speaking as a former Title I teacher, UEA leader, and the former Utah State Democrat Party Education Caucus Chair. Um, so let me scroll up so I can see here. Okay. I wanted to start my comment with a few words from Dr. King's speech. I am from Memphis, Tennessee as well, and this means a lot to me. I have a dream that one day on the Red Hills of Georgia, the sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners will be able to sit down together at the table of brotherhood. I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they're not judged by the color of their skin, but the content of their character. Looking back over the last few decades, Dr. King's dreams have become reality, but at the current time, we seem to have gone so far in the right direction that we're now on the wrong path. We're now labeling black owned or Hispanic owned businesses and products yet excluding other races like whites in this case, 
this is the exact opposite of Dr. King's dream. Equity is about having, uh, not about having the same outcome, but same opportunities. I've asked numerous people over the last weeks and no answers. So I'll ask you as well. What opportunities do white kids have or adults have that are not afforded to other color of skin? I feel silly even saying that. I'm highly disappointed in the state of Utah for even considering and entertaining this for teachers. I worked with many teachers and never encountered that any of them treated kids differently based on their skin color. Spending so much time creating programs on teacher training and programs for these classrooms regarding these issues is a waste of funding and time and be better focused on helping with mental health issues as well as teaching personal responsibility, accountability, and self-preservation. Um, let's see, let me fast forward. I hope you can take the emotions and feelings out of the equation long enough to realize, logically speaking, while some people still need to have some healing from past actions, our society it's today fine. isn't what it was in the 1950s. We need to build each person, each child up as a person and stop focusing on the color of their skin. Thank you. Thank you, Jessica. And finally, Linda Isom, are you here, Linda? I am, can you see me? Yes, you're here. Okay, well, thank you so much. I've really um, enjoyed listening to all this. My name is Linda Isom and I live in Layton and I have four children ranging from eight to 18, all of which that are in Utah schools. Three of my children attend Utah charter schools and one attends Davis School District High School. I have two biological boys and 12 year old African twins, African American twins who are 12. We've all been talking about this anti-bias training, and I think we all want the intentionally cultural response teaching. Um, I think as a parent, I'm gonna go off script and I'm gonna appeal to you as a parent. <sighs> Sorry, I wasn't gonna do this. My family is uniquely intertwined between two worlds loudly spewing vitriol and hate at one another. We see how poorly back black people are treated and other minorities. And we also see those who are intent on making every white person pay for all of our country's past sins and disparities. I see a lot of white parents fearing for their children and what is being taught at school. They fear their child will go to school and be told they are less than because of the history of the way their white ancestors treated people of color and some who continue to do so. I would like to address the gentleman that says there is no data that racism still exists in school. A quick Google search will give you hours and hours of reading of racial, racial disparities and incidents that occur in Utah schools today. Not made up, not left or right wing, children, children that look like my children. But I have a lot of people worried about if they have to send their kids to school, they'll have to reprogram them. And, and, and give them positive influence and I will or give them positive influences and make them feel good about themselves. The way the dialogue is without more anti-bias training and the reason why we're sending it to the children is because we're failing as a society at it because we, as a white person, no, you don't wanna fear for your children, but as a mother of black, black children, I fear it all the time. And that doesn't mean that they're constantly having racial slurs at them. That doesn't mean that. That means that I have to gear myself up quite a few times a month to be able to reprogram them and tell them because of their black skin that they are just as important as their brothers who love, adore, and cherish them who are white. Linda, thank you thank for you. your time. Thank you. Thank you. We, um, we really appreciate all of you who signed up today. It's um, good for us to hear um, your viewpoints, your reasoning, your experiences, and we'll certainly take all that into account as we deliberate and, and go forward trying to uh, do our best to make education in Utah happen for our kids and to take care of all of our kids. 
Um, we'll move on now with the agenda. Um, Dr. Norman, have you got that? I do. Thank you. Um, and I wanted to thank the committee for allowing us to do this information item that is that recognition of staff members. I have to say how much it means to them and know that they are recognized and that the work that they do is valuable to all of you. So, so thank you for this privilege of being able to speak to the good work that is being done um, at the Utah State Board of Education on behalf of, on behalf of you with our staff members. So first, uh, there's three different areas that I wanted to uh, really re review. The first is, um, as you're aware, the State Board of Education is committed to this vision of upon completion, all Utah students are prepared to succeed and lead by having the knowledge and skills to learn specifically and lead meaningful lives. So to accomplish these goals, staff of the board are engaged in supporting the everyday work to achieve the goal in assisting the board to create these equitable conditions for student success, advocating for the necessary resources, developing policy and providing effective oversight and support. So this month we are highlighting teaching and learning um, educator endorsement pathways. Due to the efforts of over 15 teaching and learning staff, there has been a significant redesign to our educator endorsement pathways. And with the board's amendments to R277301, staff assumed the responsibility of designing competency-based endorsement pathways. And this was to enhance the flexibility and provide multiple pathways for educators to earn endorsements. Specifically, um, staff worked with educators and higher education faculty to determine the necessary competencies for the knowledge, the skills, and dispositions educators are earning um, towards each endorsement and what would be needed to be prepared to teach in that area. And once those competencies were developed, the design teams worked to establish multiple pathways that educators to take, could take to earn these endorsements. Moving forward, each endorsement requirement has at least two pathways to achieving the requirements. And this is a big deal, especially to our LEAs. This might mean university coursework, a micro-credential, a competency exam, a specific certification, um, other options um, to demonstrate competency. Our teaching and learning staff demonstrated innovative thinking in designing these new pathways, which would allow for more flexible opportunities for educators seeking an endorsement. We will officially release the new endorsements in the summer of 2021. With, um, and with a two year transition plan for current educators and universities. So the first thank you to the teaching and learning team for this huge lift in making this happen. Second, we have, um, so if any of the teaching and learning staff are on here that helped with that, just turn on your cameras and do a wave to the board members so that they know who you are. That'd be awesome. So there's Director Th Fronson, if you can have this, any of your, your other staff members um, that are on here as well, thank you. Next, we have, and I'll have them turn on their cameras um, first this time. Um, we have Christina Yamada and Ashley Higgs, and they're, um, this is for the Utah K-12 Computer Science. Um, they have been leading the charge for Utah K-12 Computer Science for the Utah State Board of Education. This includes the creation of the K-12 Computer Science Standards and the administration of the Computer Science for Utah Grant Program. This helps students with crucial thinking skills. It encourages students to think critically develop problem solving skills, and it also prepares our next generation of learners, teachers, thinkers, and even innovators. Educating students in computer science provides them with highly digital, high, highly valued skills in the 21st century workplace, especially creativity, collaboration, and digital literacy that also align with Utah's portrait of a graduate. To date, all 41 districts and 33 charter schools have started the process of creating plans to realize this goal of computer science for all Utah schools by 2022. Christina Yamada and Ashley Higgs have provided leadership, technical support, and innovation to keep computer science moving forward despite the challenges of the pandemic. Therefore, I'd like to recognize Christina Yamada and Ashley Higgs for all that they have done during this unprecedented time to help support our LEAs create computer science opportunities for all of Utah school-aged children across the entire state. So say hi, Ashley and Christina. Thank you so much for all of this huge work and efforts that have been done, especially at this time. So our third area, um, and this is an area that we don't speak a lot about. And so I'm just super excited to um, talk to you about adult education. And we have five members um, that we're gonna be highlighting. And I'm not sure if they're on here or not, but if they are, turn on your camera and let's, let's give our board members a wave so that they know who you are. Um, there's an attachment in uh, the backboard backups and I can um, bring it up really quick in just a second about why um, they're being recognized. 
Um, when you look at the flyer, it's titled Why We Need Adult Education in Utah. And adult education in the state of Utah takes many shapes and forms. And the numbers in this handout cannot begin to paint the overall picture of staff, committed students, and partnerships built over years. But they are a good place to start. The why, what, and who numbers provide the foundational canvas for our work. And page two adds the details of color and texture that make you think. In our 40 plus programs, our board members, were you aware that there was 40 plus programs in adult education? With our nearly 18 million in state and federal funding, adult education services empower individuals to become self-sufficient with skills necessary for future employment and personal success. Five full-time staff members, which um, of course come with other duties as assigned, um, are Brian Olmsted, Stephanie Patterson, Danielle Peterson, Adam Little, and Tondalea Stitt. And they help to guide this work through technical assistance, professional learning, and program monitoring. Sometimes it might seem like we are working in the shadows, but thank you for allowing this momentary spotlight to shine in all the good things that they call adult education. Please take a moment to see that attached flyer. And I have to tell you that one of the things is I was in a meeting with Brian Olmsted the other day, and one of the things that they would like for their adult education participants is not just for them to complete it, but when they're done, it made a difference in their life for their lifetime trajectory. And they now have a new opportunity and a new experience. And I think that that is one thing that I hope the board takes that minute to look over that flyer to see those great works that were done. Brian and team, can you give everyone a quick wave on so they know who you are? Thanks, everyone. And again, um, thank you for this opportunity to be able to share those amazing things that staff are doing and working on behalf of you as board members. And just another thank you to all those who are involved in those important areas. We don't get to see each other very often, and I know you're working there in the background, but there is a lot of good happening at uh, the Utah State School Board, um, even though we're not able to interface directly and see all that. So thank you very much. We appreciate you. We'll, we'll look at the next item on our agenda now. Um, I believe we're moving down to um, our key definitions item. And um, I think, Patty, you were going to talk a little bit about that. And then we have Casey here to help us as well. Yes. So one of the things um, that was the, the been requested and as we heard from public comment this morning and we heard some from yesterday and even in the previous meetings is what does equity mean? What does it mean to all of us as individuals? What does it mean to staff? What does it mean to board members? What does it mean to community, parents, students? What does it really mean? And that is one of the things that with the guidance of Chair Hansen um, to say as a, um, especially as the standards committee moving forward with all of this work that the access committee has, you know, with their recommendations and the work not only of access um, committee recommendations, but the work that the board wants to be doing and the work with the resolution and what that looks like moving forward, then what is the definition of equity? Well, the board has an approved definition of equity, but with that board approved definition, we wanted to review it one more time and um, also be able to show where it's at um, within the work that the USBE staff has done so wherever it's mentioned and um, how it's being used, and then to review one more time the approved definition and not only uh, uh, review it, but then also to be able to say, this is what the definition is and this is what the definition is not. And then move that forward to the board for discussion um, for you to be able to look at and um, provide further discussion. So I'm gonna turn the time over to Casey Depart. Director Depart is the Director of Equity, Diversity and Inclusion. And she'll be taking you through the two documents that are in. Thank you, Deputy Superintendent Norman. Hello everyone, I'm Casey Dufart, Director of Equity, Diversity and Inclusion, and I'm going to begin by sharing my screen. I'm gonna start with, oh, I need permission to share, please. Okay, try again. Thank you. And let me know if you can't see. Fatty, thumbs up. Okay. All right, so I'll start with the definition and equity is the equitable distribution of resources based upon each individual student's needs. Equitable resources include funding programs, policies, initiatives, and supports that target each student's unique background and school context to guarantee that all students have access to a high quality education. So let's start on the left side with what equity is. So equity is, let me see if I can, Scroll down a little bit as I talk through it. There we go. 
Equity is a consistent, equitable distribution of resources. Equity is based on individual student need while valuing student voice and agency. Equity is providing funding, programs, policies, initiatives, and supports that remove invisible barriers. Equity is targeting each student's unique background. Equity is recognizing each school, school context and climate. Let me scroll down. I'd rather just hit the, the okay and then recognizing tailoring flexible supports to maximize student growth and confidence and equity is incorporating culturally responsive and inclusive practices that ensure high outcomes for all participants going to the right what equity is not equity is not maintaining the status quo Equity is not a singular professional learning opportunity, so a workshop or a conference. Equity is not a commercial program or a civics lesson. Equity is not focusing on one identity. Equity is not avoiding skill development that are necessary for students to be prepared for post-secondary opportunities. Equity is not based on creating equal conditions for all students and equity is not an excuse for setting low expectations or accepting success or failure that is dependent on any social or cultural factor. Any questions on that infographic? Let's see if I can see the chat. Let's see. Looks like um, we have a hand up from board member Earl. Yeah, I just. So I have a question. Um, this is just overview. Is that what we're looking at here? So these yes. items came from the is and is not. What did that come from? Is, so that or is came, it just yes, that came from our where we have equity throughout. I'll get to another document that talks about where equity is defined throughout our agency. But we pulled primarily from things like our vision, our PCBL, or per, per, I want to say personalized competence-based learning framework. Uh, anywhere where we have defined equity and given strategies or recommendations, that's how we create this infographic throughout USP. Okay. okay. Yeah, sure, Hanson. Yeah, Chair sure, Hanson. Can I? Yes. Um, and board member Earl and, and director of your Dupart, thank you so much. Uh, that question is important because this was created as a work mat for board members to be able to look at after showing both of these documents and being able to move back to it for a discussion for board members. So this is the overview meant for uh, all of you to look at and then to be able to discuss what you would like, what you'd like to change, keep, add to, and whatnot. So this is a, a developed work mat. Okay, thank you. So I think it might be valuable for us um, to have Casey continue through the rest and see how uh, the history, I guess, of equity and its definition inside the USB, how we've used that, um, where it's been applied. Um, and then we can come back to this slide as um, Dr. Norman said. Sure. Okay, Chair, I'll go through the document. This is looking at equity within USB. And I will make this bigger because I see that it's small. Patty was like, Casey, please zoom. <laughs> Let's see, can you see the first page? Currently, the first page is blank. I'm looking, I see that. I had it ready. Yes. What I will do, let me stop sharing and pop it back up again. And we're looking at equity within USB. There we are. All right, let's try that again. Okay, better, Patty? All right. Yes. So let's start with, these are our internal equity definitions and references. So this is our strategic plan. And this is kind of looking at our vision, our mission, our goals, strategies, and metric. And then I put in opportunity gaps and how we define that. So the board's vision is for each Utah student to be prepared to succeed and lead. When we examine our statewide metrics for public education, we find significant differences by socioeconomic background, race, disability, and other characteristics. These differences reflect gaps in opportunity to learn both outside and within the school system. 
The figures below illustrate these opportunity gaps for each of our statewide metrics. And I won't go, I think what I did was just pull how we defined it. Next is vision. So this is our vision. Our vision states that upon completion, all Utah students are prepared to succeed and lead by having the knowledge and skills to learn, engage civically, and lead meaningful lives. Next is our mission. So the Utah State Board of Education leads by creating equitable conditions for student success, advocating for necessary resources, developing policy, and providing effective oversight and support. And this is looking specifically at our goals and strategies. So early learning, personalized teaching and learning, safe and healthy schools, effective educators and leaders. And this is our definition again which was at the top of the infographic in the previous document. But we have it throughout most of our frameworks and our documents, we refer to it. We have our resolution denouncing racism and embracing equity. So all our policies, programs and activities shall promote unity and civility among diverse groups. Our portrait of a graduate identifies the ideal characteristics of a Utah graduate after progressing through the K-12 system. And these are aspirations not necessarily meant to be quantified and measured. And then the competency that was most reflective was respect. And we will show respect by acknowledging differences, looking for the good in everyone and showing due regard for others, feelings, rights, cultures, and traditions. And then that's the infographic for our portrait of a graduate. With our, our vision again. And then our definition of personalized competency based learning educators engaging all students with high expectations for shared learning goals and empowering each learner to take ownership of their strengths, needs, and interests while tailoring flexible supports to maximize student growth and confidence. And again, PCBL does refer back to our board approved definition of equity. And you'll see on our PCBL infographic, you see equity embedded in along with purpose and vision, student agency, customized supports. And then the board approved definition again within PCBO. We define culture responsive education. So our USBE's first imperative regarding educational excellence for each student state, each student state will be to set the general statewide conditions in which each student can excel including equity of educational opportunities and culture responsive practices to promote each student's academic success and well-being and resources and the Utah State Board of Education policies and practices will be aligned to high expectations and successful outcomes for each student. Internally, we do have a culturally responsive and equitable workplace committee that's working in reviewing our agency structures, uh, thinking about our professional learning, our HR practices, and reviewing our data internally. So this is internal work that is not for external distribution. We have external partners. So the, the Council of Chief State School Officers, CCSSO, as another external partner that we collaborate with, but they do not influence our work directly. And you can see they have definitions around equity and I will highlight here 
equity does not mean creating equal conditions for all students, but rather targeting resources based on individual students' needs and circumstances, which includes providing differentiated funding and supports and respecting students' voice and agency. And it kind of echoes a little bit of our board approved definition. So again, this is an external partner and they work with state chiefs and um, their leadership staff. Another external partner is Aurora Institute and we just kind of pulled some of their equity definitions. So for equity, educational equity means that each child receives what he or she needs to develop to his or her full academic and social potential and then they kind of do a breakdown of what working toward equity in schools involves. Again, this is another external partner that doesn't really directly influence our work, but we do collaborate with them. And we wanted to highlight civic engagement because that's a part of this conversation. So civic engagement, civic education, let me scroll down. Just emphasizing an integrated curriculum where students shall be taught in connection with regular schoolwork, things like honesty, integrity, morality, civility, duty, honor, service, and obedience to law, respect for parents, home, and family, dignity, and necessity of honest labor. We do also have the Utah Civic Learning Coalition. And they are an informal consortium of stakeholders open to all who wish to engage in the furthering of civic learning. And this coalition convenes quarterly to share ideas and collaborate on efforts to cultivate informed, responsible participation in political life by K-12 students. And we pulled out the definition of equity, civic, and civility, just because we're having the conversation on what does this look like. So we wanted to include them. So defining equity, justice according to natural law or rights, specifically freedom from bias or favoritism, something that is equitable definition of civic of or relating to a citizen, a city, citizenship or community affairs, civic duty, civic pride, civic leaders, and then civility, as Chair Hansen highlighted earlier, civilized conduct, a polite act or expression. So that's the end of what that deep dive into equity across our agency looks like. Thank you, Director Dupart. So one of the things that um, we wanted to concentrate on now is um, Casey navigates back to that original document on what it is and what it is not, is to um, have the board had the discussion about the definition of equity that is currently board approved. And then for us to be able to script um, as, as your conversation goes along, what you'd like for us to add in um, or move forward in this. Right now, there's a current um, motion that is uh, on the, the civic doc. And of course that doesn't mean what has to come out of committee. I just wanted to guide you towards what it says. And then um, what it says right now is that the committee forward to the full board, um, you know, the approval of the definition, which it's already been approved, but if there's any changes, and then two that the committee recommend to the board that staff continues to bring back other recommended definitions as needed. Again, it's not to say whether you like a word it's to say whether we the definition could be agreed upon and then be able to say what it is and is not. And so I think that's the, the common thing in moving forward is what is um, equity and then what is, what, do, what is not meant by equity when the term is being used. So Chair, we turn the time back over to you. Thank you, I appreciate um, the good work that's gone into giving us a bit of a history and, and flavor for how equity has been used by uh, the board here in Utah in the past. Um, and really our task is, um, I think this is a foundational word. Sure, Hanson, uh, we're not hearing you. Uh, uh, you may want to turn off your camera, your camera Chair Hanson. Without a good definition. This that Chair Hanson, Chair Hanson, we're not yeah. hearing you. You're breaking up. Yeah, you're breaking up. You might want to turn off your camera yeah, while you're I'll speaking. Yeah, I'll try that again. I'm okay. not sure what's going on. We've got the blue skies. Can you hear me now? Is that better? Yes. 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 Much okay. better. Sorry. I guess you won't have to uh, to look at my face while I speak. Um, but uh, I think our our task is really to um, 
see if, if we agree with the definition of equity that's been used in the past um, by the board, or if we need to add to that or uh, take away from it in some way, um, and use that as a foundation for the other work that we're going to be doing as we talk about at training and, and really um, what other things need to be done um, in Utah in this area. Um, I just to start this discussion, when I think about equity um, in Utah schools, um, I think we've, we've heard a lot about uh, the Wi-Fi initiatives that have gone on to try to um, get kids access to Wi-Fi so that they could learn like other children have. We put a big effort into that as part of this uh, COVID experience that we've been through. Um, and that is certainly an, an educational support to try to help kids have an equal opportunity um, to uh, have access to educational programs or high quality education. Um, I think about, uh, I talked with our superintendents um, up in, in my area, and one of the things they brought up was, um, for example, um, magnet schools in the Ogden district um, are located in different areas, and um, they found that one of the barriers for some um, students uh, in some groups was transportation. Um, the parents were both working, and so the kids couldn't get to the magnet school. Um, and so they put uh, supports in place where they had uh, buses that could pick up those kids and get them to the school that they needed to, to be in um, to achieve to their potential. Um, I think a, a really stellar example of, of equity in our schools is USDB, um, the Utah School for the Deaf and Blind, um, where we take children who um, would really have a difficult time succeeding in our mainstream schools and we give them all kinds of supports to, to help them with their individual needs um, and allow them to achieve to their potential. So those are some ideas that I had as I was thinking about this. Um, I know we've got a couple of hands up already and I think um, we'll take board member Strait and then board member Earl um, on this with the goal here of um, getting to a motion around the definition of equity. Yes, thank you, uh, Chair. Uh, I'll take my hand down before I speak. So I, I think as a matter of uh, pushing this discussion, uh, I would like to, to make a motion and uh, then we can work from that point. So in our recommendation to the full board, I would move that the board reaffirm the current board adopted definition of equity I'd like to make that a starting point. Uh, there's a, an, oh, I should clarify, that's now located in our, in our uh, strategic plan. I should clarify that. So as I thought about this, and this has been a, something that's been, been on, oh, I guess I need to ask, can I speak to the, to the motion, Chair? Certainly, so the motion is that the, uh, we forward a motion to have the board reaffirm the definition of equity that's shown in orange at the top of the equity is is not page, which comes from our strategic plan. And please go ahead and speak to that. Thank you. And I just wanted to point out when you look at the general plan online and you print it out, the mission and the, the definition are on the same page because equitable is highlighted in, in the mission within the strategic plan. But over, over the last uh, few months, as we've went through this process, and we've asked for more information and, and worked on this, I just keep coming back to the, the general plan and all the work that's went into that and uh, how that then goes throughout, uh, not only the general plan, but also documents that are attached to that, such as portrait of a graduate and our personalized competency-based learning. Uh, the definition of equity continues through those. They're very well aligned and I appreciate that greatly. You know, um, <clears throat> I think we need to uh, really focus on that. And if we need to make any changes, I think we need to be, be wary of that since this has went through that process. And when I'm finished speaking, I really would like to have this question answered. I am almost certain that everyone on the board, except for me, already knows the answer to this question. 
But the question I'd like answered is, I just want to know the genesis of this definition. I know where it's located. I know that it went through the process of the board. And I know there's a lot of attachment to that. I was appreciative last night when, when Chairman Huntsman uh, spoke about equity at the end of uh, board meeting. I was appreciative when uh, Superintendent Dixon talked about the definition of equity in our strategic plan uh, yesterday during our board meeting. I appreciated Deputy Norman, who has not only mentioned it today, but also in our last meeting, she emphasized the strategic plan and the things that we're doing there. Uh, two members of our committee here, Board Member Belknap and Board Member Cannon. Uh, I have a specific uh, memory from our last board, board meeting where uh, Board Member Belknap brought up three bills that specifically the board had been, been working on and supported and uh, representing, I mean, Board Member Cannon, excuse me, uh, said, well, let's divide those. And Board Member Belknap reminded uh, board member Cannon that this was in alignment with our strategic plan. And that clicked in my mind at that time. And board member Cannon said, oh, I retract that request. I agree with that. And we went on with the, the meeting. That really struck a, a, a chord in my mind of how important the general plan is to, to the members of the board. And I, I appreciate that a, a great deal. I so appreciate the comments that were made at before meeting by members of our, our community. I've appreciated the work that they've done to communicate their thoughts and their concerns. And uh, I feel very confident that this action, maintaining and reaffirming what we have here in our definition of equity is the correct path. And I will then now defer to what direction we go from here. Thank you. Can you hear me now? Okay, good. Hopefully we've got things fixed on this end. Um, I wonder if staff could comment just on where that definition of, of equity came from. Is there someone who predates me who can go back to how that was adopted into the strategic plan? Trance, and I'm more than happy to, but Superintendent Dixon is also here, and it might be. We will always defer to the superintendent. So please, Superintendent Dixon, if you can help us. Well, I'll, I'll give you my recollection, and I think, thank you, uh, Sydney Dixon, State Superintendent of Public Instruction. Thank you, uh, Chair Hanson. And I, I think we have board members. Uh, I think Board Member Cannon and Board Member Belknap were both part of that discussion when we adopted it. So I refer to their memories as well. Uh, when we started laying out a strategic plan, I don't know, four or five years ago, the work started back when um, when I was a deputy, but then we also leaned into this definition talking about equity a few years ago when we developed the four goals and the vision and the mission. And there, uh, the board wrangled over the words. Uh, we had a discussion about where equity should be in the plan. Should it be a standalone definition? Should it be in some narrative? Should it be in the mission? Should it be in the vision? So the board debated all of those things. There were words taken in and put out uh, and we ended up with the definition that we have. So staff did not write a definition and say, here it is. Um, staff did certainly support and promote the idea of equity being a foundational part of the strategic plan somehow, somewhere. I think we had two or three different ideas about where that might land. But at the end of the day, it was decided by the board that it would be put in the mission and there, there was, uh, uh, a, a lot of dialogue and debate and voting over each word that went into that mission. I think I, I would just add that uh, as a companion piece, uh, and I'm I'm thinking back, I, I can actually remember a couple of board members, although I won't mention them by name, uh, that actually had divergent views about it. But at the end of the day, um, they they all agreed that we should have a definition of what we mean by equity. And that's what you see in the orange box. So all of that came from the board. Thank With, you, Superintendent. We had input. I don't want to say we were silent, but there was a lot of public debate about it from the board. Uh, and we certainly wouldn't expect you and your staff to be silent on something like this. We appreciate all of your input um, to help us with these sort of things, but thank you for that history on that. Um, board Member Earl, I think you're next up. 
Yeah, actually, I went back and watched part of these meetings, and I just let me just share a little bit more insight. Um, the term equity was, as as was said, um, you know, back and forth. There was a lot of as far as the mission statement, what to put in, what not to put in. Um, and when it came down to the final vote, and that's when it came before the board. That was just uh, January um, 2019. That this, uh, it was, it was the last few minutes that it was moved um, to put it in again. I, Scott, you actually made that motion to put the word back in, and there wasn't a, it wasn't a consensus, but there needed to be some definition, and this was the definition that was suggested. So to think that. I don't think this definition was thoroughly vetted and I think it needs a lot more vetting. So I think I'm glad we're doing this. So this wasn't the part that was vetted, but the mission statement and vision were definitely vetted as was as was talked about. And I think there's a lot more pieces to this that need to be need to be looked at. Um, so I is the best way to make recommendations. I know we've got a, a motion on the floor. Um, we have a we have a motion. You can speak um, for or against the motion. If you want to amend that motion, you can make an amendment. But I think we're working with the motion to accept that definition. Yeah, I I would actually make a motion to um, uh, maybe even a substitute motion so that we can. I, I don't know. I would like to clean this up a little bit more than what we have here. So can I just I don't know. Can I just speak to my uh, thoughts and then. We can go from there. Is that the best way to do that? I think that's fine if you want to do okay. that, and then we'll come back. I know that's not as structured. Orderly. Yeah, that's I just, fine. I'd like us to see um, equal opportunity for success, and it can rely on the resources. It can rely on um, initiatives and policies, um, but it. I think there needs to be something in there about. Um, we talk about uh, backgrounds and school context, but I really think there needs to be something in there about families, being able to support parents and families. Um, so those that's a couple of my thoughts. And here's what, okay, I kind of did the is and is not, so I wasn't sure how we were gonna structure this. And maybe I should have talked with um, Patty Norman ahead of time or something, but whatever we do, it can't be louder than the families. In other words, equity and what takes place in our schools can't be louder than our homes and our families. And so that individual um, learning and that success model needs to replicate what the parents um, would like to have done or, or provided for their children. And I think that speaks to some of the things we addressed earlier. Um, it, it, in my view, it can't be invisible. It can't be unattainable. And it can't be rooted in grievance or victimhood. It has to, equity has to be solution-based. It has to be something that um, is tangible, that we can actually measure, we can actually, um, we can see. It has to be high in expectation. So let me see if I had just a couple of other things. It has to be um, part of an ownership. So when we talk about, um, gaps in opportunity, um, I think we really have to ask ourselves, is it really an opportunity gap? Because from all the research I've seen over the last couple of months and all the, all the things taking place, we're not necessarily, while there may be a disparity, there isn't necessarily an opportunity gap because most of the things and almost all the things I've seen that are very thorough from not only this, the state board and the state board members, but also our staff, they are very good at making sure they look at every avenue and close um, any kind of barriers that they see. And those aren't invisible barriers. There may be some that are harder to identify, but I've seen that when we did our, our um, English language learner that we've done over the last couple of months um, and just approved, we did extensive research into that and we'll continue to move forward. And I just have one more comment it needs to be um, consistent, steady, and deliberate. Um, equity does. It needs to be something we can rely on that isn't changing, other than improving upon, making incremental improvements. And I see us doing that currently. 
So that, in other words, if it's that, it's not reactionary or revolutionary, right? It's steady and continuous and something that um, communities and families and educators can rely on. So with that being said, I'll, I'll leave it at that for right now. I just think we've got we've to clean this up a little bit, add some components to it. Um, this wasn't necessarily something we struggled with, so to speak, when we put it in. It was just a definition to make sure we had something to define it because it was so, there were so many varying opinions. And I'll leave it at that for right now. Okay, thank you. Um, looks like board member Belknap has her hand up and we'll hear comments from her. And I think what we'll do is let's give everyone a chance to talk and then let's come back to the motion um, and we'll decide how we can move forward that way. But that will probably be the best way to get the ideas on the table. So go ahead, Laura. Thank you, Chair Hanson. I actually, um, after Dr. Dixon spoke, I think that was accurate that there was a long debate on this. However, I also think um, Board Member Earl is right. It was one of the last votes of the day. However, I do not think that we rushed through to make this really good definition. Ha I do appreciate the fact that Jenny has an idea to put in something in here about um, equal opportunity. And so maybe while everyone has a chance, I'm wondering if staff has a place where we could incorporate that in here as an amendment um, moving forward, just look at it. And then I'm sure, I don't know if Janet has something she wants to say on this as well. Chair, that's all I have on that right now. Okay, thank you. Um, board member Cannon, we'll hear from you for just a second, please. Or as long as you want, I guess. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> uh, and as uh, I, I remember the uh, strategic planning uh, efforts that we went through, I remember that it was important to me as a board member, and I think others, that we have um, a focus in our strategic plan on equity. I have gotten lots of input from people that aligns with what uh, Laura just said, that um, the focus on equity needs to include a focus on uh, equality of opportunity. And I uh, like that because I believe that that's something we can control. Uh, there are things that we can't control, but providing uh, equality of opportunity and the equality of equal distribution of resources based on individual student needs. These are things that we can control. These are things that we can act on and do. And so um, I'm lining up my thoughts with uh, board member Belknap on this. Can I make, oh, sorry, I'll get my hand back up. Yeah. Just one second, I'm gonna try this with, with video on for just a second. Um, and I, um, I think that we, I'll just chime in for a second and then we'll go back in order. We've got Grant and then Jenny. Um, and then um, back to board member Belknap, you still got your hand up, it looks like. Um, I, I think that we have, and I'm looking through um, what we've uh, published before on this, um, and we do talk about equal opportunity for high quality education. In fact, if you look um, in that general definition that we have, the one we're talking about now, all students have access to a high quality education. I think that access is the um, opportunity. Those are um, words that are used in the same way. So we're giving kids access to um, high quality education with the goal, as we've said in our, our portrait of a graduate, that they will be able to uh, be successful in life and, and lead meaningful lives. But that success will look different for um, each student. Um, not all of them are going to go to Harvard. Not all of them are going to go to um, the um, technical college. Um, not all of them are going to um, achieve success in the same way, but um, we want all of them to have the tools to be successful and to achieve to their um, potential. So if we wanted to use the word opportunity instead of um, access to, to high quality education, I think that's kind of semantics for me. Um, my board member all talked about family. Um, I, I think that this um, equity piece is certainly to work with families. 
Um, but in some cases, our, our kids um, don't have um, the family support that, that we would hope they have. And I'm not sure how, how we deal with that, that piece of things where, where kids don't have it. Then, then on the education side, we step in and try to help out where maybe uh, either to get parents to, to be more um, proactive in helping or to, in some cases, step in and uh, give kids the advice that we would hope that parents would, would give them regarding their educational path. So I'm struggling with that one right now, but those are my thoughts right now. We'll go to board member Strait and board member Earl and then board member Belknap. We'll just run through again. Go ahead, Thank Brent. Thank you. You know, you know, thank you. So uh, my, my main concern was really well answered when with the genesis of how this came about. And I just like to say that for me, this is ours. This is already ours. It wasn't developed by some outside group. It wasn't pulled from some textbook somewhere. It wasn't brought in from Moscow. Uh, it's ours, we own it. And uh, I appreciate that, that greatly. Uh, in regards to opportunity, I, I just put the motion out there as a starting point and I would absolutely be open and friendly towards uh, uh, opportunity. I, you know, I don't want to muck it up too much because I think it's a, a well, well done uh, definition of equity. But if we find an appropriate place to put opportunity, I think there's nothing wrong with that. So that would be awesome. Hey, thank you. Um, back to you, board member Earl. All right, I have a suggestion. Um, Besides the point, we have a little bit of conflict when you defined equity by saying equitable. You're defining something by itself. That's like saying black is kind of blackish. So um, this is what I'd recommend. I would re recommend equity, and I just sent this to Patty, is equal opportunity for success. And I'm using my words, so we you would use whatever here, by helping students be agents. And I'm using the term that was used earlier from our public comment of their own uplift, which may include, so striking that first line, um, sorry, I lost my spot here, which may include funding programs, policies, initiatives, and supports that target each student's unique, I put family background and community context. So it allows for that uniqueness to be played out there. But we can't put, I. I have a problem with to guarantee. I'm not sure how we guarantee anything. Um, I, I don't know, but I do like the high, it's gotta be high quality education, right? So I don't know if that guarantee needs to be played with or not, or maybe maybe that is what we need to leave there. It's just hard to, it, it, that's an absolute, but maybe it needs to stay there. So those are my thoughts. I'll send this on to Patty, okay? And then we can decide if that's worth it or what you want to do with it. So thank you for those. Um, so Laura, Hanson. you're next. And okay. Hanson. Yes. I'm trying to make those edits as we go along. So uh -huh. um, Member Earl just stated, I'm going to put right here in red as the current, whatever we're working on currently. So I have, first of all, what was um, originally stated. The green is what. Uh, I can't Chair. see anything, Patty. We can't see anything. We, we've still got the is and is not screen up, Dr. Norman. Oh, if you've got, got Google that. Doc going, you need to share that. There you go. I've okay. I thought, okay. Um, let I me, let me share this. Okay. Let's see. I have it. Let's see if um, Director Dupar, if you could stop sharing and let me make sure that this is up. Is I did. It? You should be able to share now if you have permission. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Sorry about that. I was making those changes along the way. So let me just orient you to the document. So um, the first two on here were what were included in the board backup. Then number three is board member Strait's proposed motion. And um, this is his proposed motion. And then this is the current definition. Green is what board member Belknap added to it. If we were to make a change, then that would um, add it to it, which is with that simple piece right there. 
and then I put up um, board member Earl as she was speaking. And so board member Earl, I know that you were just speaking off the cuff. So I was trying to type it down as you were saying it. And then this is what you just stated um, via text and with the rest of your words. So if we want to work from the red, that's where we're at now, but I don't know where we're at in moving backwards and forwards on this. I don't know if this is the original motion. This was the sec the substitute motion. This was third and now we're on to this. Yeah. Hold on, we'll, um, <laughs> we'll bring that back as far as the okay. Robert rules. Uh, yes, we're gonna hear you. from Laura and then I think we'll just go back to the original motion that was made and we'll take amendments from there. Um, so let's, you know what board member Belknap has to say. I'm I'm good. I'll I'll keep working with um, board member Earls. Okay. Um, then to to get us back to where we can actually take some votes, the original motion was that we adopt the definition that equity is the equitable distribution of resources based upon each individual student's needs. Equitable resources include funding, programs, policies, initiatives, and supports that target each student's unique background and school context to guarantee that all students have access to high quality education. Um, now, board member Strait, did you want to include this? That includes equality of opportunity for student success. Do you want to include that in your original motion? Or where are we with that? I would be fine with that. I, I guess I'm a little wary of junking it up too much though. Uh, anyway, this is the board's adopted policy. So I'm, I don't mind making some amendments obviously, but I don't know that I wanna completely rewrite it either. Okay, so from what you just said, should we just, um, we'll take the green out and start just with the Equity is the equitable distribute is the equitable distribution. That'll be our motion, and then let's see if there need to be or if anyone wants to raise any amendments to that. Does that sound okay? okay that that's the well, motion. That would be fine. I would be open to. Okay, so we'll go back to the original motion that we adopt this definition, which is the definition the board's been working with, um, and then board member Earl has her hand up. Well, then I would like I would like to sub in um, the change, which is pretty significant. Do you want me to do go through each edit on that then? So, so it would be striking the first sentence, but leaving equity in. I, I don't. How do you want me to do that? That's my. That would be my uh, amendment. Yeah, so, so an amendment can either add to or take away from the current. Um, so we have to start with that as a base. So if we want to do it as an amendment, then we would need to uh, go through and edit, strike the first sentence if that's what we're doing, and then add to it. Um, Can I jump in real quick? Well, I finish your thought, but let me jump in some point here. And well, pretty much my motion would be what I cited down below. So the striking of I, however we've got to edit it. And the only other sub I would make a change on instead of guarantee I think I would put um, provide something like provide that all no provide doesn't work. Hold on. Let me okay. on. I, while you're thinking, Good Jenny, time. I just okay. comment on the guarantee. I think that what we're guaranteeing is access. So we're we're not guaranteeing an outcome. We're not we're just guaranteeing they all have that opportunity to access um, a high quality education. So okay, I'm I'm good with that. I'm good with that. Okay. I guess my amendment would be then to sub in, you know, so it would be to strike that first line, subbing in the first line that I've added. Um I and then going from there to the um yeah, going to, I think it starts, so it'd be crossing out equitable resources, including that would be stricken, and then the funding programs initiatives, and then changing family, unique family background, and then school to community. 
that would be my motion. Okay, so we have a motion to amend. Um, that's on and then the I would, yeah. Okay, Just go ahead. access to high quality. I think I would put students have opportunity to access a high quality. I'm sorry, do we have that correct now? Do we need to make a, another another edit here where um, all students have opportunity to access a high quality education? Is that what you're saying? Yes, I think so. Okay, I don't know who's got the keyboard, but it looks like we need um, opportunity to access there on that last line. have an opportunity to access, right? I guess it has to be have an opportunity. Yeah. It looks like we've we've kind of got this doubled up now. So we're starting at the red, is that right? We sure, Hanson. Yes. Let me, let me just um, make sure that I have this. So equity is the equal opportunity for success by helping students be agents of their own uplift. I'm not sure what that means. Mm -hmm. So okay. just, well, just I'm putting that out to board members, we're which may, yeah. yeah, which may, and which may, okay, can help us. Board member, help or us I'm just going to type what you want me to say in here. So oh, oh, I'm sorry, agents time. of their own uplift, which may, uh, sorry, let me look back at my note real quick here. I my think point. which may is out. Yeah, yeah, which may is out. Oh, hold on. And we're we're going to get this amendment as board member Earl would like it. And then I see that Superintendent Dixon has her hand up. Um, and then We'll go from there back to, oh, Brent just dropped his, okay. I I think, um, I, I think the which may is in there, which may include, I think, because uh, I'm looking down below, which may include, and then it's a listing of those programs so that and community that that's got and the community context has got it that's we don't have that full there which may include so that the and then that it needs to go from may include programs policies initiatives and supports because i think there could be other things too that could be incorporated in that Okay, and then um, so board member Earl, if you want to speak briefly to that amendment and we can do that, then we'll go to Superintendent Dixon. Yeah, I, I have one suggestion if, okay. if uh, I'd like to run by you. Yeah. <laughs> We're saying okay. here. Yep. I didn't see a hand up, Janet, but. Oh, I um, apologize. Yeah, are we, are we okay, Jenny, with that then as your amendment? Yeah, did, I, I would be interested in Janet's recommendation. Okay. We'll I, I'm, go is ahead, it okay Jen. to speak? Thank yes. you. Um, we say equity is the equal opportunity for success. Uh, I'm wondering if we, if it would be better said, equity is providing equal opportunity for success by helping students, et cetera, et cetera. One more time, Janet. Instead of just saying equity is the equal opportunity Oh. For success, we say equity is providing equal opportunity for success. 
Yeah, I'm good with that. We can add that in there. Okay, without objection, we'll add that to the amendment. And I'm gonna jump back to Superintendent Dixon. I keep promising you a chance to speak and it's your time now, please go ahead. Yeah, I, I really appreciate um, some of the additions and ideas that uh, I, I like, you know, just uh, context matters and um, equal opportunities, but it's not always um, equal resources. I think that's where the term equity is important. But board member Earl, I, I'm still kind of hung up on the phrase of the agents of their own uplift. It kind of reminds me of the verbiage of pull yourselves up by your bootstraps, which is sort of the antithesis of equity. And if you've ever really tried to physically pull yourself up by your bootstraps, you can't do that. So I'm just trying to understand what you're meaning by that phrase. Well, it speaks to what we talk about in all of our, um, in a lot of our documents. We talk about, um, we talk about um, personal responsibility. We talk about um, being accountable for things. And so that's what I speak to there is that they are in control of their future and that we're gonna provide them the opportunity for that to take place. And so I didn't really, that, that's interesting. You took that from there because that's not what it is, but they are, they are the ones that are in control. We are the ones providing the opportunity and they can take control of the, that opportunity and be an agent of their own uplift. In other words, to move in the direction they choose to go. Um, and that's what I would, that's where I would go with that. Okay, so if I may, uh, Mr. Chair, just clarify. Sure. So you're, so you're saying that if we remove the barriers and provide them with opportunities, then it enables them to be, um, to move forward according to their own desires and goals. Am I capturing that correctly? That would be correct. They can be, okay. yeah, thank you. Okay, we have uh, board member straight. Yes, my, I, I appreciate the suggestion. I, I appreciate this, this other, these other ideas. I guess that that's where I'm having some difficulty. We're taking a definition that was developed with an extreme amount of effort and work, and we're piecing one together now as a substitute. So I have a couple suggestions. First of all, I would be willing to accept uh, this amendment uh, to put beginning with equity is the equitable distribution of resources and equal opportunities based upon each and just reads from there. Let's keep it simple. I Everything I've heard from all the emails that have come through in the last few days is that that opportunity, that e equality of opportunity, not equality of outcomes. That was a message that's, and I hear it, I, it resonates. Uh, I'm willing to accept that because I think, I think it is uh, consistent. And uh, boy, I, ju I just hate to piece something together. Now, we send in the recommendation onto the board. We still have the opportunity to hear these things out. Uh, and we may think upon this over, over, over the next uh, month, and maybe we come back with some fresh, fresh ideas, but I think it's a mistake to piece together this right now and then send that on as recommendation that completely changes our, our strategic plan. So I don't think it changes our strategic plan to do something simple, but I think we, we have a danger here. Anyway, I'll let others speak again. Thank you. Um, we'll go here. to board member Belknap and we're speaking to the amendment right now. Please go ahead. Oh, hand down, Laura. Can't hear you. It, it is because I'm not speaking to the amendment. Ah, I see. Okay. I, I would, I would like to maybe make a suggestion that would include the amendment, 
that if, if, if this wouldn't be approved, that we send this, that this somewhere is kept so the board has opportunity to see what we have discussed. Okay, I think that that's a good idea, but I don't know how all this is gonna get retained because we're not doing attract changes on the document. Um, so they'll see different versions, but they won't see all the real-time editing. Is that, I think that's all we can do. Okay, um, I am gonna speak against this amendment and I'm kind of on the same lines as, as Brent, where I think um, as I look at this, um, I think that we can define equity in the way, because equity is, is so, has become so ambiguous what that means. I think it's okay to take the big word equity and define it as the equitable distribution of resources to, based upon needs. So equity and needs it takes me, I guess, to that infographic that we see a lot where the kids are looking over the fence and we have different size boxes under each of the kids so they can see the baseball game. Um, depending on um, the kids' characteristics, um, you know, their family background, um, their economic background, um, different kids need different supports. And I think that that's what that piece of it is. Um, equitable resources include funding programs, policies, initiatives, and supports that target each student's unique background. And I think background includes the family piece when I read that, I think that's a part of, of the, each child's background. And then their school context, which I believe would be the path that that child is on you know, going forward, whether that's a, a um, CTE type path or a, an honors type path, um, take all that into account and give them the supports that they need. Um, and then guarantee that they have access to a high quality education. Um, so they have the opportunity to um, get into uh, the advanced classes um, uh, if that's what they're suited for. Um, it, I think that it's, it's not a, a slap together definition of equity. I think that it's a very complete definition of equity and meets the needs. I do, um, we use the word opportunity in other places in all of the USB uh, E context. Um, I think it's in our vision. I see it in the um, the resolution um, on racism. I think we have that there as well. Um, trying to see where else I've seen it. Um, but I, I think that that word opportunity is there and maybe as another amendment, we can find a way to expressly put that in. But uh, right now I, I won't be voting for this amendment. Um, Janet. You have something, and then I think we're going to wrap up and get a vote in on this. Um, so we've got Janet and Jenny with their hands up. Laura, is your hand up again? Laura? Okay. So Janet, Jenny, Laura, and then um, I think we'll call discussion. Well, we'll keep going as long as it's productive. Go ahead. Thank you, Chair. I, uh, I believe that I uh, align my thoughts uh, quite well with Scott's and, and with Brent's. I think I remember putting a lot of time and effort into coming up with this definition of equity, having it say what we wanted it to say. I do believe that I would, would support the uh, amendment to the original motion that Brent suggested where it included opportunity. Uh, I do note that our resolution says uh, Utah schools should be a place where all students feel safe and are given equitable opportunities to succeed. So that could perhaps be redundant, but I know that was something that we heard loud and clear from constituents. And so uh, I think I would probably support uh, an amendment uh, to the original motion to include something about opportunity as Brent earlier suggested. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So Jenny and then Laura. Yeah, um, the term, I, I think instead of own uplift, because I think that's, um, it's sounding like that may re be concerning or something, but own educational outcomes instead of uplift. Patty, would you, is that okay to change that so that it's, it's giving oh. some type of a- Yeah, you're the maker of the motion. I think we'll allow okay. that. 
that change here? And then I would actually suggest that we take what we have here and we take it, we're meeting on the 25th to talk about, um, to talk about this, to talk about other things. Um, I would recommend that we actually just bring these items to that meeting and have a discussion there with the full board because we're gonna be talking about our strategic plan. We'll be talking about these items. And so it would seem completely appropriate that that would be a time frame to do that as well. So we can have additional dialogue. And then that gives time for people to go through these, look at them. We can actually find out, I, I wish I'd written down exactly where this definition came from. I don't think the definition was debated. I think it was pr proposed at the very end of the meeting. I think equity was debated thoroughly. Um, but anyways, it, it gives us that opportunity to look at that a little more thoroughly. That's my recommendation at this point, to take all these definitions and take that dialogue there to our, the meeting on the 25th. Okay, I think we're gonna proceed with the motion. We'll let Laura talk, but I'm not sure that um, that meeting is a place where we can take action on anything, Jenny. That's a, a work group, um, so I'm, I'm not sure. I think that this will get to the board. Maybe we can do some work in that meeting that prepares us for a board action, but I don't know that we can take action in that meeting. But please go ahead, Laura, with your comments. Um, yes, I'd like to make an amendment to the amendment, please. Okay. And I think I think it would actually help Patty if you go back to the original, um, even though it is adding and taking away from the amendment, that I'd like to make the amendment to be equity is the equitable distribution um hold on i wrote it down is the equitable oh gosh where did i put it now equity is the equitable distribution of resources and equal opportunities based upon each individual and each individual needs and um then i need to look at them the amendment for just a minute please um, agents of their own. Okay, and I, I think, um, Laura, I think that if we're making an amendment to the amendment, I think we have to take the amendment and actually make the changes there. Well, we I, I, I think you can do that uh, maybe after I show you where they are and then okay. otherwise it might be a little wrong. Otherwise we'll need to vote on this amendment and then if we want to make another amendment, we can do yeah, that. I don't think so because I'm changing the amendment. Well, okay. maybe, I'm, maybe I'm not, but there's pieces of this amendment um, that target each student's unique background. Do we have that up above? Oh, we do. Okay, then it's not an amendment to the amendment. Sorry. Okay. I um, I think we'll go ahead and vote on this amendment, and um, and then we'll come back to the original motion and see where we go from there. So the um, amended motion is that we amend the definition of equity uh, and forward that definition to the uh, full board um, to read that equity is providing equal opportunity for success by helping students be agents of their own educational outcomes, which may include funding programs, policies, initiatives, and supports that target each student's unique family background and community context to guarantee that all students have opportunity and access to a high quality education. Um, board members, please, or committee members, please vote. Okay, it looks like that amendment fails, so we're back to the original motion. Um, and the original motion is that... Uh, uh, sorry. The definition. Can we, okay. yeah. can we go back to um, all the nays and all the, the yeses and nos? I only oh, got. I'm sorry. Um, it looked like um, we had. I had Laura was... Belknap, uh, yeah. Janet Cannon, and that's it for nays. Uh -huh. Okay. Um, oops, we're not seeing the same thing that I saw. Everyone, please vote again and hold your vote on the screen. It's they're disappearing pretty fast. Yes. Thank but, you. Uh, it looks. Janet, can you put your vote up? I see my vote up. Okay, yeah, they're they're disappearing. It looks like we had one in favor, which was board member Earl. 
and um, the rest were nays. Okay, thank you. Yeah, sorry about that. I don't know why we're flashing off so quickly, but they are. Okay, so we're back to the original motion um, and board member Belknap has her hand up. Yes, I'd like to amend an amendment to the original motion, which is to add the green and equitable opportunities in there. Okay, is that equal opportunities or equitable opportunities? Excuse me, equal, thank you. Uh, okay. Are you gonna help me, Patty? Is that not grammatically correct? It, it's not grammatically correct. As I'm looking at it, it and sorry, Chair Bell, uh, Vice Chair Belknap, may I propose um, a wording change that might make Please. it? Okay, um, equity, so if I read it aloud now, it states equity is the equitable distribution of resources and equal opportunities based upon each individual student's needs. So it needs to have a qualifier. Equity is the equitable distribution of resources and equal opportunities for students based upon their needs or based upon individual needs or something like that. So we have to connect it. Does that make sense? Yes. For success. <laughs> yeah, so equity is the equitable distribution of resources and equal opportunities for individual students. What if we just said uh, equity is the equal equitable distribution on, of resources second. and opportunities? Okay, now, Laura, you're the maker of the amendment here, so you get to kind of say yay or nay on these, but I think we're going to allow a little bit of free conversation to I, see if. Yeah, more. I think free conversation to make it clean. Okay, so Janet, you had a suggestion. Um, we've got Brent with his hand up and then back to Superintendent Dixon. So, my my suggestion was just to remove the equal, the second equal that's in green, and it would say equitable distribution of resources and opportunities. Okay, Brent, do you have a comment to that or to the? Yeah, um, I do. So I think by definition, we're talking about education here. Equity by definition is that every student has access to those opportunities. Hope I'm saying that right, but that, that's the way I read it. So anyway, oh, I think what we have there, yeah, what we have there, I think that's better. Okay, Superintendent Dixon. Thank you. Well, I was madly writing because I, I was trying to reflect back on what board member Earl said about sort of the redundancy of equity and equitable distribution that just sort of struck me. So, so it made me wonder if it needs to be defined as educational equity. Uh, and I was just trying to write down, you know, ec ec educational equity means that every student has access to resources and opportunities um, that may include funding programs, policies, et cetera. Um, and takes it, you know, just the rest of that stem, but I was trying to see how to lean into it because I think board member Earl made a really good point that it does kind of has this circular effect of kind of equity and equitable. Yeah, we're, we're almost using equity in parentheses as equity mm -hmm. in, in the way that we're using it is this, and maybe it is educational equity. Yeah, so just yeah. repeating that again, and I, I'm, I mean, I'm not suggesting the verbiage as much as just the idea of educational equity means that every student has access to uh, resources and opportunities, because I think we need to remember when we're talking about this, we're talking about students with disabilities, students learning English, students who are accelerated and need additional opportunities, um, students who, um, I'm probably missing categories, um, but anyway, there are, there, you know, there are a lot of, of different things that we look at where we distribute resources, programs, policies to help improve outcomes for students. And so just trying to be more broad based and thinking of equity in our frame, it really is about educational equity. So I don't know if that helps, but board member Earl, what you said earlier, just. Chair Huntsman, I mean, Chair Hanson, I'm open to whatever amendment comes out here. Okay, let's, let's talk for just a minute and try and get this amendment and then we'll go. I just had a thought and then we're going to Jenny. Um, so when we talk about um, now we have, uh, equity is the equitable distribution of resources and opportunities. Uh, in my mind, I'm not sure that's right. Equity is not necessarily equal, but the opportunities, I think we want to be equal. Um, so we wanna give 
equal opportunities to, for example, get into an AP class or equal opportunities to, um, to access a CTE class or go to a magnet school or those sort of things. So I, I think if we say equity on the resources and then we say equity on the opportunities, then the, the opportunity is unequal. And I'm not sure that's what we're after. That's not the definition we've been working with in the past. If that um, strikes a chord with anyone else. Um, let's, we'll go around again here, Jenny and then Brent. Well, that, okay. That's what my motion said is providing equal opportunity, but then it still allows for the resources. But anyways, I know we voted that down. But just an FYI, I did go back and listen to the last five minutes. This definition is, was just presented by Tiffany Stanley at the end. I'm sure it came from somewhere, but it was not vetted. I'm just letting you know that definition was not thoroughly vetted. It was added at the last minute. So there was something there to define it. So us moving things around and adding to really, and I know we're doing that, but I'm just letting you know that was not part of the thorough vetting that took place. So anyways, but I do think we need to have equal opportunities. It needs to be that. It needs to be the opportunity is there. Whether or not they take advantage of it is a different thing, but that opportunity is there. And I think that's what we are doing. So however we want to define it. Define it. Okay, Let, let's have we a have, but let's, We're back to, I mean, the opportunities here is just, just op yeah, anyway, yeah, okay. Let, let's let I'm, Brent, Brent um, see what he has to say, and then I have a suggestion maybe. Go ahead, Brent. Not to take this in a different direction, but I'm just reminded of an experience when I was a kid and growing up, every year we'd go cut down a Christmas tree in the mountains. And uh, when we go up and we start wandering around the mountain, finding the, the right tree, inevitably, we would look at a tree and say, no, we can do better than that. And we'd, we'd walk and we'd walk for miles sometimes and we'd look at a tree and it, inevitably we'd come back and cut down one of the first ones we looked at. And so, uh, and oftentimes it was the first one we looked at. I. And so I think we can junk this up too much. And, you know, it, if we're going to use equity, it's not exclusive of equal, but just like my own children, each of my children have had separate different needs. I don't treat them equally. I treat them equitably based on their needs, their strengths. And so I, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't agree or, or support the, the using of the word equal in regards to educational equity, not because they're mutually exclusive, but it means something different. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Brent. And I, um, my wife and I had that experience with the Christmas trees this year. We wandered all over the UN is outside of Evanston took the whole afternoon and finally went back to the one that we saw right off the road. So um, I, I would propose, Laura, and again, this is yours, that, um, that we do clarify and say educational equity. I think that makes sense. Um, educational equity means, or excuse me, educational equity is the equitable distribution of resources based upon each individual student's needs um, to provide equal opportunity and then keep the rest of it the way it is. Okay, do we have that on here yet? Sure, read? Hansen. So, sure, Hansen. So again, yeah, one more time. Educational yeah, so. equity means. No means. No, excuse me, educational equity, we're back to the educational equity is the equitable distribution of resources based upon each individual student's needs to provide equal opportunity. And then leave the rest of it as is.
And I would say equal educational opportunity, but I think we've got, and it's education in the sentence two times. So that's my proposal, um, board member Bell. For my amendment. I, I actually would, would accept that as my amendment. Um, and also, um, also noting, just making a note that we might make this change in the board may vote next time to bring it back to exactly what it was, or they may add or take away words. And, and so we can debate for hours and yet the five of us can't make that decision. We can just pass something on. So I'm comfortable with this amendment. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else want to comment on this one? Um, Superintendent Dixon. Thank you. I'm just wondering if, it, if opportunity should be plural. And I realize at the end of a Friday, I may not be thinking clearly, but it just seems like a plural is warranted. Resources, each individual student's needs. Yeah, I, I, I wanna call on Janet for a lifeline there. I think it could go either way. Um, educational offer, you know, to provide, we're talking about educational opportunity, whether that encompasses all the opportunities in education or whether it needs to be you know, plural to talk about each of those specific ones. I don't know. Janet, you want to weigh in? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> um, well, I, not from a grammatical point of view, but just from my, my own sense of what we're trying to see, say, I, I think maybe uh, pluralizing it enlarges the idea of what opportunity might be. So um, I'm I'm good either way. I think it makes sense. Okay. Adding the adding the plural, I think, um, does that. It says that there's you know more than one opportunity in this big um, world of educational opportunity. So, and maybe Can that we does leave that kind of open to our grammar people to, but, to either. No, this this one's not a grammar question. I don't think this is more our meaning. But okay. Anyway, I think adding. Right equal opportunities um, may actually point to the different paths that kids have through their education. It may be significant to do that. So I, I, I like that. Okay, yeah. hey, Laura, we're back to you. Are you okay with this, with your amendment? And then if anyone else yes, wants- Yes, I am. To, that is my amendment. We are gonna vote if there's no more Maybe. hands up. Do we have hands, Sydney or, or I, Superintendent Dixon, your hand's still up. Okay, Jenny Earl. I would recommend we add opportunity again at the end then to guarantee that all students have, oh, let me look, have opportunity and access. I think opportunity and access um, to a high quality education. Mm -hmm. But Laura, that depends on if you want it there, I guess. So. Is it redundant? Well, most of, some of this is redundant. So we talk, yeah. What What's the reason, Jenny, to have it there? I just, I just the opportunity part. Um, once again, I don't know, maybe we are redundant. Yeah. Yeah, I'm. I'm okay without it or with it. I, I it's, not, it's not fitting for me just because we've talked about equal opportunities and then there we're talking about access to high quality education, which I think I think the access is talking about opportunity again, right? That's fine. You can we can take it out. If it does it add does it add meaning to it? That's fine. We'll I I it, it's fine. You can take it out. I'll just re look at things over the next several weeks and see if there's any amendments, so. Okay. Yeah. Anyone else on this one? Okay, I think we're ready to vote then. The motion before the committee is that uh, the board amend the current definition of equity that's found in the Utah State Board of Education Strategic Plan to read Educational equity is the equitable distribution of resources based upon each individual student's needs to provide equal opportunities. Equitable resources include funding, 
programs, policies, initiatives, and supports that target each student's unique background and school context to guarantee that all students have access to a high quality education. Um, committee members, please vote. So Nora Lee, are you seeing? Um, I only, I'm only seeing Laura Belknap and Janet Cannon. Wow. I'm not seeing the others. I can see more than that. So um, I'm an I, and we can do a roll call vote if that is needed. Um, but it looks like um, board member Strait is an I, board member Hanson's an I, board member Earl is a nay, board member Belknap's an I, and board member Cannon is an I. Thank you. Okay. I believe that that's um, now we're back to the original motion. Takes us back to amended the motion. Yep. And is there any comment on the original motion? Would it be easier if I just withdrew that motion at this point because I voted in favor of the amendment? Or what's the? What's it's the an point? amended motion now. Yeah. So now, now we've amended oh. it. And right. so, so we need still to got it. take that original motion as amended and vote on that. So if there's no comment, we'll go ahead and vote. So the, um, the motion before the board then is to, um, and it's not written out exactly the way that it should be, I don't think, um, that the board um, amend, now it is, I guess it's the same as we just read, isn't it? Um, that the board amend the current definition of equity that's found in the Utah State Board of Education Strategic Plan to read educational equity as the equitable distribution of resources based upon each individual student's needs to provide equal opportunities. Equitable resources include funding, programs, policies, initiatives, and supports that target each student's unique background and school context to guarantee that all students have access to a high quality education. Committee members, please vote. And we have Scott Hansen is an I, board member Earl is a nay, board member Strait is an I, board member Belknap I, and board member Cannon is an I. Is that what you see, Nora Lee? Thank you. Okay. And just like that, we're through action item number two. <laughs> um, next. We'll move to number three on the agenda, which is the access recommendations for anti-racist and bias equity literacy, professional learning for educators. Um, we'll ask um, Dr. Norman to introduce this one for us. And then we have uh, a couple of staff members, I believe um, Casey and Kim are here with us as well to help out. Please, Dr. Norman. Oh, Patty. Hello. She's she's frozen, but luckily um, she's frozen in a good position. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Any chance of her unfreezing in the near future? Probably not. Sure, handsome man. She is. She's back. There she is. Okay. <laughs> There she goes. Sorry about okay. that. It just kicked me out. Um, yep. I'm not the I'm only one struggling this afternoon, but please, we're on. Um, I don't know how much you heard. We're down to action item three now. Um, and I believe you're up to introduce that. And then um, we have staff standing by to help out. Yes. Um, so this is um, a, in regards to the access committee recommendation number two in regards to what was being stated uh, for professional learning opportunities. So with this, I'm gonna just go over some of the items that we have in board backup, and then Casey's going to guide you through them. And then we're going to have also um, Kim Fratto that's going to be presenting what is called the TRP so that board members can get the inside look at what staff uses when um, our LEAs and teachers make requests, and then opening it up to some of the other documentation. Board member Earl also, um, has a document that she would like to share, and then we'll move through the rest of it. So right now, if we look in the backup items that are 
currently online. Um, one of them is the current professional development that is already or professional learning that is already happening. So there are laws and rules that are related to equity. There's the um, the teacher res the training resource training request portal. There, there we go, portal. That that's where the requests are made, and then the equity professional learning throughout the state of Utah. So we're going to turn time over to Director Dupar as um, she leads us into these documents. And remember that as staff leads you through these documents, it's only for um, the ability for board members to look and preview, and then to or, um, then left to the committee to decide what recommendations or actions after that. Okay. Thank you, Deputy Superintendent Norman. I will. Yes, Kim. Start, may I? May I make a comment? This is Board Member Cannon. Oh, please go ahead, Janet. Yes, um, I emailed earlier this afternoon uh, a couple of proposed motions. And so uh, when it's appropriate, uh, hopefully uh, Dr. Norman has a copy that could be looked at by the committee. Okay. Thank, thank, thank you. you. Yes. We'll, we'll look at those after the presentations then. Okay. All right, Casey Dufar, Director of Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion, and I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Kim Fratto, and she'll walk you through the training request portal. Thank you. Can you all hear me? Yes. Good afternoon. I'm Kim Fratto. I'm Assistant Director of Special Education. Do, can I share my screen? All right. Tell me when you can see it. Are we good? Yep. Okay, so I have been asked to talk to you today about the training request portal, and I'm just going to give you a little bit of background. Um, we refer to it as the TRP. It's a tool that we developed in student support um, so that our LEAs can reach out to us when they um, need some help with different training or professional learning across the state, professional learning and technical assistance. So um, the purpose is to help us identify and, and support them in the needs that they have identified um, for their LEA. And so they submit a request through the portal. We review the request weekly with our student support leadership. And um, we determine if we need to assign it to a staff member um, of USDE to follow up on. If there are resources that are already out there and available that have been developed by the USDE that we can refer them to or if we have enough requests um, and, and enough data to support maybe creating a statewide training to have a broader reach. So. I'm trying to fast forward my screen here and it's not going. I don't know why it's not moving. Okay. There we go. All right, so um, one of the things that we wanted to talk about today is that we get, we're getting a lot of requests through this quarter for training on equity, diversity, and inclusion um, related topics. So that's the focus of um, the requests and the data that I'm gonna share with you today. And so we have questions um, related to how um, the best way to respond to this moving forward. And currently, again, it's, it comes through student support. I don't know why my, there it is. Okay, so here is the student, um, the training request portal, and there's the link if you wanted to um, jump on that portal. But again, it's to help us coordinate professional learning. We have categories that are listed that LEAs can choose if they, what category they want to have training in. And so you can see here are some of the numbers. We've had a lot of requests for equity. The, the, down to the side, behavior support, child nutrition compliance, there's a drop down menu that comes down that they can um, pick which training um, they're interested in or where they need the support. And so right now where you've had 10 that have come through equity and then we have a box that's other. And then the data that I'm showing you, we've had 12 requests come through the other that are related to equity. Um, the drop down box just says equity. So sometimes uh, they're not sure if their training goes in that box. Here, I've just gathered some of the, this is some of the information the LEAs are submitting when they're asking us for these requests. I'll leave that up for just a second so you can read through.
I'll go to the next one. I can come back to anyone, any of those. So who's making the requests? Um, these are the, the positions or roles um, within the LEA that are requesting support in these areas. We, re we require that all um, training requests go through an administrator at the LEA level. So we, we do, um, have some training that we require uh, that LEAs participate in if it's a result of a corrective action plan. So 37% of requests that have come through have been a result of a corrective action plan, 63% have not. The equity trainings don't fall into the category of corrective action. And then we have a question of what is your preferred method of training? And we have a lot of this past year, as you can imagine, that it has been virtual. And then questions. So I can stop my share. So that's the data that I wanted to share with you and some of the um, requests that we've been getting from the field regarding training for equity, diversity, and inclusion. So committee members, it looks like um, board member Earl has a question for Kim. Please go ahead. Yes. Yeah, Kim, my question is, we had, um, and I don't remember the exact numbers that we just went through, but there was like 19 people that were not even uh, right there, 28, sorry, 28 people that they weren't an LEA specialist, they weren't a general education person, they weren't a district spec, Who, who's that 28? So it could be a teacher on, oh, may I answer? Can you hear me? Yes, yeah, please, okay. go ahead. Yes. All right, so um, yes, they could be a teacher on special assignment or a coordinator in a, um, in a local education agency that works in the district office. So, um, or they could be a teacher that requested it. And then when we follow up and assign it, we reach out to them and say, this has to go through your local administrator. And then we direct it back through the local administrator because sometimes teachers do make the request. Okay. So who decides what category they fit into? Because we do have LEA specialist, we do have administrator. I'm just trying to understand. The person that's filling out the request, they, they, they self-select the category. Oh, okay. So they might not see their exact position or title that they have in their LEA, so they put other. Okay, all right, thank you. Uh -huh. And thank you, Kim, for clarifying too. This note at the bottom, um, helped me to understand that even if a teacher makes a request because of something they see in their classroom, that it has the request has to be vetted by somebody in administration. Um, the USB staff aren't responding just to individual teachers request without that one level higher to make sure that um, the training is generally applicable or, or important enough, I guess, in that specific situation that the district thinks it should be done. The LEA, I guess I should say. Is that correct, Kim? Yes, that is correct. Um, and some cases, teachers might request something from us and they don't realize that that training is available in their local LEA. So we would then, in that case, help connect them with um, the people that they need to be reaching out to in their LEA to support them. Okay. Thank you very much. I hope you'll stick around for a minute, Kim, as we talk about all this. We may have questions as we come back. I don't see sure, any I will. Ways right now. So let's move on to the next part of the, the presentation. Okay, let me stop sharing that. Thanks, Kim. Mm -hmm. Oh, and Chair, can I add that with the TRP, when we get requests, we also reach out to whoever made the request and we make sure that they have some like an equity leader. Some districts have equity coordinators just to put the person in contact with whoever that support is, kind of like what Kim was referring to, saying, do, do you know what your supports are first? And then we continue with the training. We always want to make sure that they have somebody on site and that they know what those concerns are. Does that make sense? Yeah, okay. thank you. That clarifies. All right, so I will move on to equity professional learning throughout Utah. And this is just looking at us as a state to see what our equity literacy looks like. 
and I'll begin sharing. Let me zoom before Patty tells me to hurry up and make it bigger. Oh, that's interesting. I open it up again. All right, that should be big enough. All right. Chair, can you see? Yes, we're okay, seeing your screen. Thanks. All right. So, looking specifically at special education first. So we do not have a specific course that is designed specifically for equity. We have the latest course is Title Distance Learning. It has equity practices embedded throughout the module. There is also a specific section within it titled Equitable Distance Instruction, Universal Design for Learning. And we're currently in the process of reviewing all of our available Utah multi-tier system of support UMTSS modules to ensure that equity is addressed within each one of those. And we're working with a AIR, I want to say American Institutes for Research, to get those all updated right now. So those are in the process of being revised. Teaching and learning, there is not a single course that says equity in the title. We do have the equity strand and the principle to promote teaching and learning course. In Midas, there are 39 courses being offered between now and March 31st currently in the system. And of those 39, none of them explicitly state equity. Um, and looking through the course titles and descriptions, they only we only saw one that might also have something explicitly tied to equity. And the state pre preschool workshop course ID 42612 states, USBE and DWS have collaborated to organize the state preschool workshop. This workshop is designed to increase the elements of high quality preschool education across Utah. And the presenter topics include keep overview of phon phonemic awareness, science and preschool, embracing diversity in the classroom, math instruction, developmental observation tool, dot, um, and parent engagement, lesson planning, coaching, and more. ESL, Title III, student support, and those are linked. You can link to the professional learning opportunities for Title III and their promising practices playlists. We also have equity labs, which we're currently doing. Let me go back up. So USBE has equity labs that were created to empower LAs to identify local solutions to overcome inequitable circumstances in their communities. And the purpose is to increase equitable conditions for all Utah students. USBE staff identify potential areas to increase equitable learning opportunities for every student, in particular students who experience barriers in assessing learning opportunities. And the equity lab process is determined through peer reviewed research board rules and applicable laws that align with the board's mission, vision, goals, and portion of a graduate. So I've been able to participate this year in these and they're really helpful for Elias kind of diving into their data and they'll kind of problem solve together. It's usually like a multidisciplinary approach and they'll come up with action plans and strategies together during that process. And there's links for the equity lab as well. And we add, we incorporated in things, other things going on throughout our state. So you will see the one Utah roadmap and that's linked as well. That is equality and opportunity and six strategic priorities looking specifically at equity. Wait a minute. Expand opportunity and improve life outcomes for people with historically and systemically less access to opportunity, including women, people of color, those who are LGBTQIA plus individuals. We recognize the unique inequities and varied experiences found within Black, Indigenous, Latino, Latin, Latin X, Asian, Middle Eastern, Pacific Islander, and multiracial communities. We commit to creating initiatives that acknowledge the history of our state and nation, the disproportionate outcomes across systems and the intersectional identities of our community members. And then we have the Utah Compact on Racial Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion. 
we the signers of the Utah Compact on Racial Equity, Diversity and Inclusion affirm that all people are created equal under God. A racially equitable state requires us to act and create a society in which race and ethnicity do not determine or limit value, opportunity, and life outcomes. We also affirm two key principles on which everyone can agree that all Utahns must have a truly equal opportunity to prosper and that economic inclusion is essential to creating these opportunities. We believe many of our nation's societal ills can be solved by providing equal opportunity and access to education, employment, housing, and healthcare. We further recognize that we must listen and learn from each other, realizing that as we deepen our understanding of differences, we can in turn be better understood. And then the Utah system of higher education has a resolution to advance equitable systemic change as well. I wanna say there's four steps, yeah, three steps. So establishing a diverse equity and inclusion work group to cultivate collaboration and coordination among the board and system leadership. Part two, create an equity lens framework for higher education leaders in collaboration with institutional chief diversity officers, community leaders, and system leadership to better understand, identify, and address systemic equity issues as they establish priorities, set goals, revise system policies, and govern the Utah system of higher education. And then a draft of that document will be shared at the October board meeting. And three, ensure statewide attainment and performance goals include measures designed to close statewide inequities and are part of the system strategic plan. And UCI also, also has an equity lens framework. So, and they break that down and that's also linked by assess, examine data, engage in plan, implement and measure success. And the HCR 015, concurrent resolution emphasizing the importance of civic education. Now therefore be it resolved that the legislature of the state of Utah, the governor concurring therein, hereby call for a renewed emphasis on civic education and teaching the skills necessary for students to become better educated and prepared to become the next generation of engaged citizens. And I believe that is the last one. So that's basically looking at equity literacy throughout our, our entire state. Any questions there? Let's see, committee members, do we have questions there? Um, looks like um, board member Cannon has her hand up. Go ahead, Janet. Thank you. Uh, Casey, as you reviewed these, um, I am wondering if you saw anything regarding training in equity for uh, potential, potential teachers or those in our uh, teacher education pipeline? I reached out to my chief diversity officers and I reached out to my institutions of higher ed. And it seems like it's very different depending on which institution of higher ed that you attend. So it's not something that's really standardized. It feels like it's very program specific. Yay, um, board member. Yeah, I guess I just have a general comment. Um, special education, everything we do is training for equity. So everything we do creates access for students. Um, so it, I, that may not be, I mean, may not have a terminology that has equity listed in the title, but everything we do creates access of equity for children, um, including the way we inter you know, engage with parents and, and engage with the community. So I just, I, I just wanna make sure the public understands that it's not like special education is not, you know, doing anything. That's all they do, right? I mean, all their questions they take, all the concerns they take have to do with accessing environments, the least restrictive environments. So I just wanna make sure the public knew that. Thank you, board member Owen. I think that is a great lead in to yeah. the next part. Yeah, so the, it is. Discussion. So, um, yes, uh, let's see, Casey, if I can have the screen. Sure.
All right. Let's see. Can everyone see it now? It is super small. Can you yeah, put it in uh, view that, mode? Uh, yep. Bring it up to page width or close. There we go. Great. Okay. So uh, it was also asked by the committee for us to review the laws. Um, the, the, and I'm going to read the motion that we were asked to do. It says on the motion, um, pursuant to board policy 1002, the committee as co-sponsors to this recommendation request the executive leadership to uh, place on a future agenda um, assessment, sorry, a rule outlining options per, for professional development offered regarding diversity, equity, and inclusion. The rule should outline the minimum required content and also stress the importance of adhering to an applicable rule, state, and federal law, including any law related to political statements and prohibiting content that sh shames any student. Uh, that's actually the motion that was coming forward from this one. So there is a, a full um, motion that was asked for, and this was one of them, which is what are the current laws in, um, in that are um, here and right now. So the first one of those, I'm just gonna go through this and I'm not gonna go through it line by line, but instead by the questions that were asked. So the first one is, are there rules or policies that the USBE has voted on that would require districts to conduct educator or student training on culture, diversity, inclusive, inclusivity, or equity? So um, there are many, there's not just one. So there, there are many laws that have all of these things. So we're gonna answer that as, as we go through this. So has anyone from USBE, the staff or the specialist, sent any recommendations, materials, or resources that encourage districts to do trainings on these subjects? The answer is yes. And, and as we move further down this, the reason why is um, stated as well. USBE provides professional learning and technical assistance is provided in most of these areas surrounding the rules, regulations, monitoring, reporting, compliance, et cetera, in most of the areas listed below. So it does go into what you were just speaking to, board member, um, Earl, it goes into the special education rules, the Office of Administrative Rules when it comes to the Utah Schools for the Deaf and Blind, federal laws, rules, and regulations, which includes uh, family, edu family Educational Rights and Privacy Act, or FERPA, and indiv Individuals with Disabilities. So I, on this, when you go through it in the board backup, each one of these is a live link. So each one of these is linked out. So there's further information that anyone would want to look at. And then the next question was, are there any state or federal laws that specifically require educators or students to be trained on equity, diversity, or inclusivity? The answer to that is yes. And here are the following areas in statute. And so, you know, that and, and wanting to outline first, what is the role of the board? And the role of the board is that they have general control and supervision of the state's public education system. And what that means right here is the State Board of Education shall establish rules and minimum standards for the public schools that are consistent with the public education code, including rules and minimum standards governing the following. So access to programs, competency levels, curriculum and instruction requirements, services to students with disabilities, and school productivity and cost effectiveness measures for federal programs. It then states that the state board shall determine if the minimum standards have been met and that the required reports are properly submitted. So that is the role of the board in, um, in, in this piece. Then it goes on to state that in, in this um, statute right here, that indicators for elementary and middle schools, that the state board is responsible for equitable educational opportunity as measured by academic growth of the lowest performing 25% of students as measured by progress of the lowest performing 25% of students on a statewide assessment of English language, arts, mathematics, and science, and B, except as provided in section 53E-5-209, English learner progress as measured by performance on an English learner assessment established by the state board. So that speaks to the point of when we have disaggregated populations, and I know that was um, some of the, the initial com comments coming in today, was um, why we take the groups and split them out. It's in looking at the different data sets. And as everyone knows, a piece of data is just that, it's a piece of data. And any piece of data then always has to have the question as why. Why, why, is, why are the numbers um, as they are? What do we do with this data set? So a piece of data set is in mathematical terms called a naked number until you have the context 
context of the number and what it can be used for. So that is the purpose of disaggregating it is to be able to say, if the data shows as last time was presented in this committee, that there is a discrepancy, then the question should be why. It shouldn't be taken as um, you know instant call to action, instant anything. It should just take that question as to why, and then a deeper dive into that data to be able to say what are the practices, what are the policies, um, procedures that um, create the conditions for success in order to help for students to succeed and lead. And then as we move forward, there's the indicators for high school, which are similar with a few um, exceptions um, by academic growth of lowest performing 25%. It goes on and the differences are right here, post-secondary readiness as measured by the school's graduation rate, college readiness assessment described in section 53E-4-305 and student achievement in advanced coursework. So that's some of the reasons um, moving forward. Then there's the content standards. All the content standards embed the concept of equity within them. The standards are part of how the board sets these conditions. Accountability then provides a look at how well students were able to achieve on those sets of standards. Then we get into the federal laws that go along with that. When federal funds are accepted, then the guidelines for accepting those funds must be followed. So um, here are some of those federal funds that we receive and then we agree to those conditions and we agree to meet those conditions upon accepting those funds. When it comes to section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act, Office of Civil Rights, um, protecting students with disabilities, um, IDEA with the Individuals with Disabilities Education Improvement Act. And then there's also been um, a concentration this year on the federal Title IX new regulations regarding discrimination based on sex. And then there's also the professional learning for the McKinney-Vento Act. Um, and then um, bullying is another area and that is a, um, according to both state law and um, the board's own rule, R277-613. And then moving forward, uh, we have suicide prevention and then the USBE's least restrictive behavioral interventions technical assistant manual also spells out what all of those are. So um, then it comes to the next question is, are these terms defined? So there is not a succinct definition that, that I could personally find and Casey, uh, Director Depart also was looking that we could find a distinct definition. And that's why it's so important that the board define these, um, these terms themselves to be able to say, since there's not a, a definition that we can point to, then what is the board's definition? There are some that kind of go along with it. When we talk about at risk, at risk of academic failure, homeless child, homeless youth, um, and some of those definitions, but it doesn't, um, so low performing, mobility, poverty, all of those have essence of um, equity, diversity, and inclusion when we're talking about special education. All of those have an essence within it, but there's not a clear definition of equity, diversity, and inclusion that we could find that um, to pull over. Then on um, the fifth element, um, how are these requirements related to the statute surrounders educating discussing such thing as politics and religion in the classroom? We do have R277-515 regarding professional conduct, and that requires educators to maintain a professional educator student relationship, including treating a student with dignity and respect by promoting the health, safety, and well-being of students, maintaining appropriate verbal, emotional, and social boundaries, and taking prompt and appropriate action to prevent harassment or discriminatory conduct towards a student or school employee that the educator knew or should have known may result in a hostile, intimidating, abusive, offensive, or oppressive environment. Then there's also the statewide ethics um, mandatory training there. So as you can see, there's, there's many places where this fits when it talks about equity, diversity, and inclusion training, professional learning, um, and opportunities to really um, clarify what that means. So we wanted to kind of establish it that way to first of all, be able to say, how do we currently determine? And that's when Kim Frado showed the PowerPoint. How do we determine the needs and how do, um, does USBE interact with our LEAs and individual teachers? Then to be able to say, what are those discrete courses that are already created? And then what are those individual courses based on the context of the local education agency? And how do we differentiate and track those? And then to be able to say, what are our requirements in providing those professional learning opportunities? Now we're gonna turn it back over to you, Chair um, Hansen and uh, for the discussion of the board and how to move forward. I have, in turning it over to you, uh, combined the three motions. I have one from you, Chair Hansen, and I have two from board member um, Cannon, and I put those onto a piece that I can uh, put up uh, upon request. Okay, and I think that's where we need to go now. Let's get those. Um, 
I, I just, I'm just letting you know, I submitted one. I'm sorry, I didn't, I just sent it on. I was holding oh, it. But okay. It's in, so um, a let's have, uh, Patty, if you, I, if you have that. Um, did you send it on just now? Yeah, I sent it on about a, about 15 minutes ago. So I apologize. I can, I'll, I'll pull it over. Okay, yeah, let's get all those up and we'll see if anyone wants to make one of those motions so that we can get moving. I do have to tell you, we need to be mindful of time. Um, we have uh, two items that follow this that are um, time sensitive that we need to get to to move them on um, to the full board. So I think we'll we'll be taking about another 15 minutes maybe to we'll get to about 55 um, on this item and then we'll have to move to those others. So we'll. Uh, See if we can get those on the screen. Let me know when you see them. Yep, I've got them now. Um, the first um, potential motion would be um, that pursuant to board policy 1002, which is um, the policy that allows us to initiate a new rule. Um, the committee is co-sponsors to this recommendation request that executive leadership based place on a future standards and assessment agenda, the following rule concept for discussion and potential action, um, a rule outlining options for professional development to be offered regarding diversity, equity, and inclusion. The options offered shall follow state and federal laws and allow LEAs the ability to create or use their own trainings. The rules should also outline minimum required content and also stress the importance of adhering to state law regarding political statements and prohibiting content that shames any student. Um, and I think we said among, uh, I think the top in the blue, I think is what we, is what that motion was. I don't think the in the black has been modified, but uh, federal law, including any law related to political statements and prohibiting content. So more inclusive than just those two sections of code. So that would be, um, the first potential motion that's there, and we're not limited to these. Um, I'll read um, Canon option one now, if I can see that one on the screen, um, which would be that I move the Standards and Assessment Committee direct staff to develop a rule that provides professional learning and guidance for educators on equity and inclusion in Utah schools based on the tenet that all races are created equal Utah law and administrative rules. Um, USB will develop a model training program to be used by LEAs um, if desired, an individual LEA may develop and implement its own program with approval from the LEA's governing board. Um, all models must follow these guidelines. Um, and then we've got educators should be accountable to provide equitable educational opportunity to all students. Educators will be trained in knowledge and skills designed to meet the needs of diverse student populations in the classroom, including allowing students multiple ways to demonstrate learning that are sensitive to student diversity. Um, creating an environment using a teaching model that's sensitive to multiple experiences and diversity, designing, adapting, and delivering instruction to address each student's diverse learning strengths and needs. Um, educators will understand it's unacceptable to exclude any student from participating in any program or deny any grant or benefit to any student on the basis of race, color, creed, sex, national origin, marital status, political or religious belief, physical or mental condition, family, social or cultural background, or sexual orientation and to engage in conduct that would encourage a student to develop a prejudice on the grounds described above or any other consistent with the law. Um, and we've got another option from board member Cannon. Um, I move that the Standards and Assessment Committee direct staff to develop a rule to, you'll have to scroll up for me. I only have the copy that's on the screen. So to provide professional learning and guidance for educators on equity and inclusion in Utah schools. Um, based on USB resolution 2021-01 and on the tenet that all races are created equal, USB will develop a model training program for educators to be used by LEAs. If desired, an individual LEA may develop and implement its own program with approval from the LEA's governing board. All models must follow these guidelines. Um, are these the same guidelines, Janet, or these are different? Um, so the uh, model one was where I tried to go through all of the the laws and uh, things that the staff had given us that related to equity, inclusion, and so forth that they've just gone through. 
and tried to pull out from those the the things that spoke about uh, what what we might guide training around. Then uh, I got to thinking about it and thinking that uh, we may want to have something that the rest of the board members were familiar with and could relate to, which was our board resolution that was that passed unanimously. So uh, for this model two, I went through and uh, highlighted things in our resolution that would relate to what we might want uh, training to be done on for educators. And so uh, model number two uh, pulls out things from our re board resolution uh, that training could be developed around. Okay. Um, and let's get the other one. Do we have board member Earls on the board as well? So we can look at that. Okay, so the um, proposed motion from board member Earl is to direct staff to create a rule containing guardrails that align with Utah law board rule and USB's resolution denouncing racism and support supporting equity in the area of equity of opportunity programming, including in the area of diversity and, and inclusion, and specifically on implementation of any professional learning, training, curriculum, or other resources. This should include the questions recommended to better assist USBE and LEAs in making decisions. And you're referring to the questions on that sheet that was- uh, Yeah, I sent, I sent that out. Is, is that correct? Okay. Yeah, and this could be cleaned up just a little bit. I don't know if it's grammatically correct everywhere, but uh, thank you, Patty. So that's, I just think we- Yeah, we, and these, these are references um, that were provided that um, are Utah law, USB resolution, um, civil rights laws, um, how they relate to the topic that we're that we're on equity, inclusion, diversity. Is that and right? much like Janet, I just took, I, I'd made a list of what was in our resolution and pulled from there um, items along that lines. And then anything, once again, with, with Utah law that would have um, fallen under that category as well. And, it, and as I was trying to put things into what I was doing, I was looking, referencing uh, what you had sent to us because I thought that that was very on point. So thank you, Jenny. I, I appreciate the proactivity of the committee members on here. And perhaps um, you're ahead maybe of, of where um, I think we are procedurally with all this. If we can, can you jump back to that first motion, um, Deputy Superintendent Norman, if you could. Yes, let me just add really quick. This should include the questions recommended. Can I put this right here first, board member Earl, so I don't lose it? Oh, yeah, yeah, let's get that on, on there. The so record, equity guidance document. Okay, yeah, sure. I just don't want to lose that. Yeah, let's let's okay. make sure it's all documented. I think that's important as okay. board member Sorry. Bell now reminded us earlier. Um, so um let me let me talk about this one a little bit and see if this would encompass maybe what is being proposed. Um, I think that in order for us, well, I don't think, I, I ask um, um, Jeff Van Holten and Patty to look into this for us. And um, in order to have a new rule, uh, which is what we're talking about made, we need to have executive leadership um, okay that and then put that on an agenda so that we could um, have a rule and, and to make the request for a rule, we have to have some basics as far as what the rule would encompass. And then we would craft the rule and then it would go before the board. Um, so as a first step, um, the proposal in this motion would be that we, um, as a committee, recommend that a new rule um, be uh, developed that would outline options for professional development in this area, diversity, equity, and inclusion, um, and then just a little background for them, the, the, the option should follow state and federal laws and allow the LEAs the ability to create and use their own training. Um, in addition, I think that we could, I think it's supposed, I mean, it's understood in here that USB would also provide a training that they could use or training modules like we have in the trauma-informed um, training. Um, the rule would outline the minimum content required and also stress the importance of adhering to state law um, 
including, and I think this was, so a state law, including laws regarding political statements and prohibiting content. Um, and we're missing that word including, because there's more than just those two sections. But um, that if this motion was to pass, that would then uh, come back to us in the committee and give us, I think, uh, a little bit more time to work on those uh, things that have been written out and, and you guys have detailed, um, both Janet and, and Jenny, on the things that should be included in a rule. Um, is that a course that we want to proceed on or do we want to try to get more detail into it now? I see Janet's hand up and I'll let her talk and then Jenny, you're another maker of a potential motion, so we'll hear from you as well. But Janet? Oh, Janet. Chair, you're, you're breaking up. I couldn't hear, were you asked, calling on me? I am calling on you. And if you couldn't hear what I was saying before, I'm sorry. I, <laughs> I hope I you could hear well, I, I, I just had some thoughts in my mind as you were reading this first option. I, I knew from the bylaws that we had the ability to create a rule as a board. But you went one step further and uh, have outlined the process here in this motion. I believe that uh, all of us are, are uh, saying very similar things, like we would like to have a, a rule based around professional development in the areas of equity, inclusion, and so forth. So um, mine was a little more specific and I think Jenny's incorporates uh, more laws and things, but I believe your motion is a good first place to start. So I would uh, be willing to withdraw my motions and would be willing to support your motion. Okay, thank you. Um, so board member Earl and then board member Strait. I, I agree with what Janet's saying. Um, I just really think it's important, especially where so many of these issues deal with um, local education entities that, that we provide them. And I, I think this is what special education usually does. Is they refer to the rule and say, this, according to X, Y, and Z, this is the direction to proceed. And so if we have rules and we have things around how to include students, how to um, engage with one another, our civil rights laws, um, do that as well, which, which this was, sorry, a little side note here. I did call a number of districts and ask if they do training other than 504s, which we do extensive training um, on that area. But as far as um, real detail about our civil rights laws, or well, I guess it doesn't have to be extensive, but just the basic understanding there, most districts don't really do much of that other than the, like I said, the 504s and things that they are applicable every day. Um, anyways, I. What was my point in saying that? Sorry. Oh, it's empowering districts, giving them the keys that they need to empower themselves, right? Here's, and that's why I felt did the questions. It's, we don't want to mandate anything. We want to provide a framework in order for them to work from or guide rails in order for them to stay within the laws um, and within an area. So they're not getting into politically heated topics, but they're meeting the needs of, um, you know, of their constituents and of their families. So that's my thoughts and I'm, I'm good to wait on my motion. And if we wanna um, put yours forward, Scott, that would be fine, our chair. Um, board member straight, let's hear from you. Thank you, I, I agree with uh, the previous two uh, speakers, both uh, board member Earl and board member Cannon. Uh, I really like this. Uh, <clears throat> I, I know that it specifies the options of federal law, state law. Does this by, by without stating also exclude uh, other factors coming in outside of that, such as critical race theory? Uh, that would be one thing. Uh, I think it does. I'm uncomfortable that it does. Uh, so I just want to want to state that any political ideologies from that are uh, anyway separate from that but uh, also I don't think it'd be appropriate to put it here now but I just like the the committee and the board to have it in their their mind that 
one thing that would be greatly appreciated by teachers would be if uh, this training is funded, professional development is funded. And I think that would be perhaps as we move through this process to just keep that in mind. And, and that's all I'd have to say. Okay, thank you. And on that comment, I don't, um, I think that you'll find that um, our state laws um, really are quite prescriptive about what can be taught and what should be trained in a lot of these areas. But I think that's the discussion for the, the next discussion when we bring this back and try to flesh out a rule is, you know, what are the, the guardrails that we need to stay within and what topics should be touched? And there are some that are required. Um, so there's required content here because there are um, laws and rules that include that. I do think um, I may have um, not included administrative rules in here, and that probably should be in there, um, state and federal laws and administrative rules, um, because those are also binding on the LEAs and they need to follow those. That, um, so I would make that amendment. Um, Jenny, you still got your hand up. Did you have another comment? I did. I just wondered if we wanted to include our resolution in that as well. And did I miss it somewhere? I don't see it in there, which really does focus on the laws again. But once again, that's something we've recently passed. I wondered if that should reference that. Administrative rules, um, Utah State Board of Education resolution on, race. yeah. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. I just feel like it. we ought to that's put that fine. in there even though it referenced laws. Okay. Um, any other board members who have comments on this? Is this a motion that we're ready to, to vote on? Okay, I don't see any hands raised, so we'll go ahead. Um, so the um, motion is that pursuant to board policy 1002, the committee is co-sponsored to this recommendation, request that executive leadership place on a future standards and assessment agenda the following rule concept for discussion and potential action. Rule outlining options for professional development to be offered regarding diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, the options offered shall follow state and federal laws, administrative rules, the Utah State Board of Education resolution denouncing racism and embracing equity, and allow the LEAs the ability to create or use their own trainings. Uh, the rules should also outline minimum required content and stress the importance of adhering to state law regarding political statements, including any law prohibiting, let's see, I think that including should be state law, including those regarding political statements and prohibiting content that shames any student, um, something like that, yeah. And then we've got to take including out down below. There's, we've got another including down that line. Yep, there we go. Mr. Hansen. Yes. Um, just right here, trainings is an outdated term and it's usually professional learning that is used now instead of the word trainings. Um, so I'm just just wanted to put that out there for the committee to consider. I don't. I think we want to be up to date and modern. So if you can bring us up to this century, please do. Okay, Jenny, you still have your hand up. Is there something? I was let, gonna let you know. Patty had her hand up. Sorry. Oh, okay. I couldn't see her. Olivia, so there we go. Thanks. Yeah, all of you need to raise your hands to get my attention sometimes. Um, okay. That's the motion then. Um, board members or committee members, please um, vote. I think Laura has her hand up. Oh, she's dropped I was totally. Off. I was totally teasing him. I was putting it up and down, up and down. <laughs> <laughs> it's not coming fast enough through my internet to get here. All right, let's vote. And I see Hanson is an I, Earl is an I, Straight is an I. I didn't see board member Belknap's vote or board member Cannon. Cannon is an I. Okay. And Laura? I. Okay. So that one's unanimously passed. And we will move forward with that to the board. Thank you. Let's um, 
go to our next items and we are, boy, we said 555 and it's 555, thank you. We have uh, now an uh, item about standard, uh, excuse me, the, the mental health screener. This is item number four on our agenda. Um, and I think Christy Walker is here to walk us through that. There she is. Take it away, Christy. Hi, happy Friday. Um, thank you for giving us this opportunity to come and speak to you again about school-based mental health screening. We'd like to thank the committee, first of all, for all the work that was done last fall to get this program up and where it is today. So a little bit of background. Um, well, first of all, we're going to be starting with a little bit of history. Well, we recognize that we have some new committee members. We want to be sure that everyone's with us as far as the purpose of this presentation. Scott Ayer, who's from the Division of Substance Abuse and Mental Health, will be speaking to us. Um, follow, well, speaking to us following my little bit of background. And then Tanya Albernaz will be speaking about the mental health screening tool that we would like to seek approval for today. So first of all, um, House Bill 323 was where this all started in the 2020 session. So what that did is it made provisions for schools to uh, be allowed to have school-based mental health screening. And it required that the Utah State Board of Education work hand in hand with the Division of Substance Abuse and Mental Health to develop a list of mental health screening tools, as well as a list of mental health conditions for which LEAs can screen. And um, last fall, both of those lists were approved by the board. So today we will be bringing to you a tool for your approval to be added to the school-based mental health screening tools list. And um, this process was something that was set forth in House Bill 323 that LEAs who wanted to use a screening tool that was not part of the approved list could send in an application with all the informational pieces and it, that tool could be reviewed by Utah State Board of Education staff in conjunction with the Division of Substance Abuse and Mental Health. And if those two entities agreed that this tool was appropriate for use, we could bring it to you today to uh, get it approved and added to that list. And so two items of note as we continue through this presentation, one, any school conducting mental health screening falls under the statute that's been established. And also we want to note that um, this is optional for LEAs to participate in school-based mental health screening. So at this point, Scott, I will turn it over to you. Uh, thank you, Christy. Scott Ayer, Division of Substance Abuse and Mental Health, School-Based Mental Health Specialist. Um, Christy, you did a great job um, summing things up. Um, House Bill 323 of the 2020 legislative session required that the division and USB come together to create this list and also the conditions that these lists uh, of these tools would be uh, detecting. And so we did, um, we started uh, by creating a current screener practice survey, survey that we sent out to the field. And we asked the LEAs and the local mental health authorities to submit to us the tools that were currently being used as practice. And uh, in that survey, we also learned that 69% of schools were already conducting screening and mental health screening. And so we recognized that this, uh, the rules and the guidance uh, was very much needed. And also that the conditions that the schools were interested in screening for were anxiety, depression, and suicidal ideation. And so based on the survey and the collection of these tools, um, we put, to, to put together that list that was presented before the Standards and Assessment Committee. And it was narrowed, refined, and eventually approved before full board, which takes us to where we are at today. Now the process uh, in board rule for us to establish um, bringing new tools before, before the board um, 
does require that you USB staff and, and DeSama work together uh, to vet these tools. And uh, we do uh, look at the LEA's information, which they provide, and they are required to provide information on the screening tool itself, the name of that tool, age and grade in which the tool can be normed, the condition for which that tool screens for, any evidence-based research supporting the effectiveness of the tool, any limitations associated with the tool, who can uh, administer the tool, what level of profession needs to administer the tool, and also a link to the website for additional information. So what Tanya will be presenting today is the screening tool Terrace Metrics, um, which has been submitted by multiple LEAs and which has passed initial review by USB staff. And we concluded that this tool is an effective and comprehensive screening tool aimed to detect the potential risk for anxiety, depression, and substance use. And we believe that this screening tool aligns with the current screening practices, as well as the core health standards established by the board. Um, Tanya, if you're there, I'll hand it over to you. Thanks, Scott. Tanya Albernos, um, prevention specialist on the Prevention for At-Risk Students team. Um, good afternoon. Thank you for allowing me to be here. I um, am also a clinical social worker, so I was recently brought on to help with the mental health screening team to assist with this project. Um, today, I'll be presenting to you the Terrace Metrics tools for your consideration. As staff, um, as Christy and Scott both mentioned, we have reviewed the tool in conjunction with, uh, with the Division of Substance Abuse Mental Health, and we're recommending it to be presented to the full board for approval. Um, the PowerPoint we're sharing with you today contains all the information required by board rule in order to consider the tool for approval. Um, and this is the same information that was considered for all the tools that are on the currently approved list. Um, today I'll present, I'll briefly present to you the mental health conditions that the tool screens for. Um, as Scott explained, the scientific data, the research behind the tool, the populations it's normed for, how it's administered, limitations, data privacy issues, and the benefits of the tool. You should have received several documents in the backup documents to help with context of today's discussion. Um, including an example of the Terrace Metric student, parent, and LEA level data reports, um, an executive summary, frequently asked questions document, and an overview PowerPoint um, sent to us from the Terrace Metrics organization. To begin, uh, Terrace Metrics is a student self report question and answer tool. Um, it's unique from the other tools that are currently on the approved list because most of the tools are approved specifically to target only one mental health condition, while the Terrace metric tool utilizes multiple screening tools in order to take a comprehensive approach at screening the student. So some of the tools integrated into the Terrace metric tool that we'll present on today are already on the approved list because it has multiple tools built in into the tool. Go ahead and go to the next slide, Christy. Um, for context, I've provided comments from the three separate LEAs who formally requested that the ter Terrace Metrics tool be considered um, and placed on the approved screening tools list. Uh, they consist of Jordan Canyons and Alpine School District. I've placed their comments on the slide and I won't read them to you, but to briefly summarize what they say, um, the reasoning they want the Terrace Metrics uh, tool to be approved. Um, are because they reference the ease of administering it to students, the simplicity of interpreting the results, and the ability to connect parents and students to resources immediately following the completion of the screener, which um, that process is integrated into the screener tool results. Go ahead and go to the next slide, Christy. The tools, Terrace Metrics tool screens for the mental health conditions of depression, anxiety, and distress associated with drug and alcohol use. Again, it utilizes uh, tools that have already gone through a rigorous process to be normed and validated for the targeted age ranges. In addition, the items were specifically selected because they're not intrusive and don't delve into the parent-child dynamics of the student. Um, just as a note of interest, the Terrace Metrics tool also has items incorporated into the tool to screen for student resilience measures. If you're interested in what those items include, uh, you can see examples of those uh, items in the backup documents that you were provided. 
As Scott explained, the current mental health conditions that are approved by the board for screening are depression, anxiety, and suicidal ideation. Substance use is not currently on the list of mental health conditions for which schools can screen. Um, because the screener has the ability to screen for substance use for the purposes of determining if there is a need for further assessment with the student, we will need to consider potentially adding substance use as a condition for which to screen. Again, this is not currently on the mental health conditions list and we will have further discussion about this at the end of the presentation. So moving to the scientific data and research behind the Terrace Metrics tool. Terrace Metrics utilizes a robust psychometric tools um, which measures have been extensively evaluated and found to be highly reliable and valid for the target age groups. Um, these are tools that are widely recognized as robust psychometric tools that have been published in at least three peer-reviewed journals and norm for the target age range. Age. Um, for those interested, more information about the research behind the tool can be found on the Terrace Metric website, which you see on the slide. Go ahead and go to the next slide. Thanks. Uh, the Terrace Metrics approach is that it has, again, several measures built into the core of the screener, and it has several measures that are optional add-ons. So the optional add-ons means that the LEAs can choose to utilize those measures if they desire to add it to the screening process. The core items include the PHQ-9 and the GAD-7, both of which are already board-approved screeners. So those are on the currently approved list. The optional add-on module for screening of substance use utilizes a tool called the CRAFT screening tool. The CRAFT is a screener that's well validated for adolescents ages 12 to 21. It is comprised of six questions des designed to assess alcohol and drug use. Um, the CRAFT is also endorsed by the American Academy of Pediatrics for preventive care screenings and well child visits, which means that it can be used, for example, in a medical setting um, during a well child checkup. The CRAFT is self-administered version that's used on the Terrace Metrics tool is designed to be used in any setting to determine if there's a need for further in-depth assessment regarding the use substance use. And if you're interested in seeing the questions that comprise the CRAFT, please refer to the copy of the CRAFT that I provided to you in the backup documents. Um, note that these questions from the CRAFT assessment would only be used with students ages 12 and up. So only if the student is 12 and up will they get those substance abuse screening questions. Go ahead and go to the next slide. The core items of the terrorist metrics are norm for grades three to 12. Um, and again, the LEA can choose to use the optional add-on substance use items, which are only for students 12 and up. Go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, terrorist metrics is administered via a cloud platform. Before students fill out the tool, they watch a two minute proctor video or they have instructions read to them by a trained designated staff member of the LEA. The student then receives either an email with the link to the screener or they're instructed how to access the LEA's Terrace Metrics platform. Most students are able to complete the screener within a 15 minute time period. Um, so LEAs can set up the system to allow homebound students to complete the screener within a specific time period of the day. Um, once the screener is completed by the student, it's immediately scored, analyzed, and compiled into a report um, for determination of next steps. Go ahead and go to the next. Um, the data derived from the student responses produces several products. Um, the first one is a student level report, which is available immediately for the designated school staff. It also produces a parent report, which is generated at the same time as the student report and can be sent electronically to the parent as soon as the school or LEA is ready to send it. Um, the third one is a de-identified aggregate summer report that's available for the school or the LEA. This report highlights aggregate strengths of the students that, that took the assessment. Um, it identifies aggregate areas of need for the students that took the assessment, so the school can evaluate those if they desire. Um, and if, if also desired, they can provide this report at an LEA level as well. Go ahead and go to the next screen. The Terrace Metrics tool can be administered by non-clinical professional level staff, and that 
Those staff are designated by the LEA to be trained. Terrace Metrics provides all the training and materials in advance of any screenings occurring within the LEA. And um, they also work with the LEA to provide templates for consent forms um, and a sample district letter for support, things like of that nature. Go ahead and go to the next slide. As far as student data goes, all student level data is maintained on the LEA or school side. Terrace Metrics does not have access to any personalized student data unless given permission by the school. Um, the only information that Terrace Metrics has access to is the name of the school, um, assessment progress of that school, whether the, the student's assessment is created in progress or completed. The indicators that the school chose for, their, for that particular screening and the number of students in the roster who have completed the assessment. So uh, Terrace Metrics has taken the necessary measures to make sure that they confirm, conform to the requirements of FERPA and PPRA. Go ahead and go to the next one. As far as limitations- Chair Hansen, just, I, um, just because we've agreed on me being a time checker, I just wanna make sure that all committee members are aware that we have 19 minutes left and we still have four agenda items. Tanya, you're doing an amazing job. Absolutely love your presentation. I'm just doing a time check to see um, if there's questions or if we want to um, figure out how to use the last part of the time most efficiently. But Tanya, it's nothing to do with your presentation. It's awesome and answering every question. So thank you. But Chair Hanson, I just wanted to do a check-in. Yeah, I appreciate that. Thanks, Patty. And we are getting close. Um, is there a way, um, Tanya, that you could kind of summarize from here and let us know? I know we have two more items that we have to get to today as well. And we do have a hard stop at 6.30. We've extended our time a half hour today because we knew we were gonna take some time on the others. But um, I believe um, last the big issue is talking about um, whether we include the tobacco screening or not. We've heard from Jordan School District. They say they wanna use it. You've told us which districts are gonna use, uh, want to, to use this. So can you just summarize quickly and try and get us to the end and see if we can make this happen? Sure, we're really close. We were just gonna also present that the limitations of the tool is that it's self-report. And the, the last slide is really talking about the benefits of the tool, which you heard from the LEAs and, um, and from the public comment that um, they really like the tool because it can provide a list of ap applicable resources for the, for the student and parent, depending on the, the student needs. And also the LEA can, um, can target uh, specific student needs for those that have taken the assessment. So that was just the end. And we were bringing two motions for consideration um, because again, they have the optional, the supplemental add-on for substance use. We, need, we either need to add substance use as one of the approved mental health conditions and approve the terrorist metric screener, or we need to approve the core terrorist metric screener without the supplemental substance abuse add-on. So those are the two motions we're bringing to you to, today. Um, those motions for your consideration and then forwarding it, it with a recommendation to the full board. Okay, thank you very much. And I'm sorry about the timing. Um, things don't always work out as planned. So thanks for being flexible with us. Um, Janet, you've got your hand up and I believe that, um, oh, just Janet's right now showing. Uh, thank you, Chair. I would uh, like to make the first motion. I did read through and go through everything uh, uh, previously to this and uh, felt quite impressed with Keras metrics as a screener. So my motion is that uh, we add substance abuse as one of the approved mental health conditions for which to screen and approve the Terrence, Terrace metrics screener and forward our recommendation to the board for their approval as well. Okay, thank you, Janet. So we have a motion on the table. Laura, would you like to speak to that? Yes, I'm trying to get a little bit of clarity as to the questions being asked here seem very similar to the SHARP survey. Does it seem like we're asking these kids an overabundance of um, the same questions? Do you even know the answer to that? Chair um, Hansen. Yeah, we can go back to Tanya. Please go ahead and answer that one. 
Okay, I should clarify that the, the way that LEAs provide this um, to students is they provide the opportunity for parents to sign up for mental health screening nights or, or for appointments to do these mental health screenings. And so the parent, it's the parents opting into this process um, if they have a concern about their student and they want to screen. So um, they would sign up and they would uh, even have the opportunity to go with the student to, to um, as the student completes the screener. Um, and, and it's, from my understanding, it's a 15, about a 15 minute process and it's done. And then they provide um, the parent and the student with the resources according to the student's need. So um, I, I'm, I'm not sure, I can't really speak to it being a duplicative to the SHARP survey process, but um, that's the process and it's, it's when parents opt into it, so. It's not the process, it's the questions being asked. I feel like we're asking these kids over and over again, are you a drug abuser? Are you, are you smoking? Are you drinking? And anyway, I'm having a really hard time with the SHARP I, survey today, so. I have, I have two questions. One, I think the SHARP survey doesn't come back to the individual. Um, so I don't believe that it's used in the same way. I think it's used for aggregate data um, across the state. I understand we're asking the same kind of questions, but I don't think it's used the same way. This is responding to the, um, the mental health screener law that came into to play. Um, I do have a question though about adding substance abuse. That would require a rule change, is that right? To add substance abuse as an approved mental health condition? Is that correct? Uh, no, the um, approved mental health conditions list is not in rule. It just says the rule just explains that we will keep an approved mental health screenings or approved mental health conditions list. Mm -hmm. um, and it doesn't outline what those mental health conditions are. So we have the list separate from the rule. Okay. And just a quick follow up is substance abuse. Um, I believe that it's designated as a mental health condition, but is that in the literature, is it seen commonly accepted as a mental health condition? Yes, there, there, um, there are sub substance use diagnoses in the, in the diagnostic criteria manual. Yes, that's correct. Okay, thank you. Any other? So we've got Laura and Jenny's hands still up on this one. Yeah, just a quick comment. I and I voiced this before. I'm not a fan of the screeners because, anyways, how frequently do they take this screener? Is it, is it done once at the beginning of the year, once at end? Is it done throughout the year? Or is they, you know, if they want to improve on something, what's the frequency of a normal screener like this one? Sure, Hanson, may I answer that? Please. Um, the, again, this is a, an option that's provided to the parents. So the parents get to decide the, my understanding is that the LEA can decide um, how frequently they just schedule these mental health screening nights and provide the opportunity for parents to opt in um, or, or they just these opportunities to opt into these screeners. So um, I, I, I don't think it's a, it's a it, there's no required frequency to take these screeners. It's just as frequently as the parents desire. Okay, and then the, it, it talks about training that can go along with it, possibly um, after they look at the information and their risk for grit. I'm just wondering what is, so they have training modules that help to increase a child's grit. Is that accurate? Yes, that's, those are part of the resiliency measures that are at the very beginning. They're not considered a mental health screener. Um, those are part of the core items that the screener um, screens for. And if if there's a lack or there's a need found to, to help the child raise their grit score, then that information is provided to the parents and they um, then can follow up with services or with whatever um, interventions they desire. Okay, I actually, um, Chair Hanson, I'd like to divide the question or vote on each piece separate if that's okay. Okay, so I'm not for adding more screener. So screen if we're going to divide that, then the first maybe we could take the first motion as um, just approving um, the terrace metric screener um, without the substance abuse questions. Is that right? And then an additional motion would be to add those. Would that be a way to handle it? 
Yes, I just, yeah. Okay. Um, let's take a vote on the motion to divide and then see if we can proceed that way. Um, all in favor of dividing? Oh, Laura, do you have something that's going to help on the motion to divide? No? Okay, good sign language. Um, okay, we're going to go ahead and vote on um, Board Member Earl's motion to divide, which would be to divide this into two questions. One, just approving the terrorist message screener. And then the second question would be whether to add and approve the um, substance abuse. So let's vote on that motion to divide. Looks like that one, board member straight, looks like that one is unanimous. Um, so the question is divided. Um, and now we're speaking to just an approval of the base terrace metric screener um, without the, the um, substance abuse modules or substance abuse portion. Um, I'll speak in favor of and I'm sorry, Laura, your hand's up. Is it time for you to talk? <laughs> okay, go ahead, please. Well, you can, you can finish speaking for it. I have a concern that the approved mental health conditions are not either part of the rule or at least the manual isn't, isn't um, mentioned so that it, we have that information. Can someone tell me why it's not in rule? what those are, or at least the manual that we're looking at is not referenced. Okay, can you answer that one quickly for us, Tanya? I think we're, that may need to be, we needed to circle back to that, but if there's a quick answer, please answer. Yeah, can, can you clarify for me the question one more time? Uh, I believe the question is, why are the um, mental health conditions not in rule or how are they controlled? So uh, those mental health conditions were brought to the board um, for their approval. Um, we just, I believe in Christy and Scott, please chime in if, if you have any input on this, but I believe that um, in the rule, again, it just states that there will be a board um, approved list of mental health conditions for which to screen and then um, the three conditions were brought to the board and the board discussed them and the board approved them. And those are the three that are currently on the list. Okay. Follow up, are they in the rule or are they referenced somewhere in no, the rule? No, they are not currently in the rule. They're not currently in the rule. They are kept separate on the, the problem. And that, that may be something for board leadership to look at and see if that needs to be handled in a cleaner way. Um, it sounds like we have a board approved list and right now substance abuse is not on the board approved list, but that's not in a rule. I'm not that... talking about substance abuse, yeah. um, Chair Hansen. I'm mm -hmm. talking about the three items. I understand. That's not, it sounds like that's not in a rule and not controlled that way, but it is on an approved list that the board voted on. Well, so let's, um, let's go ahead on the, the motion and I'll speak again in favor of the motion to approve the base terrace metric screener. I think we have um, at least three of our larger districts that are asking for this. Uh, we already have a, um, uh, sub, or a screener, a mental health screener, that the program is in play. Um, all this is doing is adding another provider to a, an existing program. So we're not voting on whether mental health screeners are okay. We're only voting on whether to add this tool and Canyons, Jordan and Alpine all want to use this. Um, my vote is that we let them use it. So any other comments on the, the that motion? Jenny, you've got your hand up. I just, I have a quick comment. I, I will be voting for this, but I because it met the requirements, I don't agree with the direction we're going with this with our kids, um, but it, that's another day. But I it, this met the requirements. So I just wanted to clarify my vote. Okay, thank you. Um, any other comments? Let's go ahead and vote on that first motion. Um, board members, committee members, please vote. Looks like um, we've got a nay from board member Belknap and eyes everywhere else, Nora Lee. Okay, then the second part of this motion is to uh, whether we, the, the standards and assessment committee forward a recommendation to the board to approve adding substance abuse as one of the approved mental health conditions 
which to screen for in the mental health screener. Um, I have a quick question for Tanya as to are the districts, are the LEAs asking for this? Is this just, this is added functionality that we have in this screener that we could use, but is there a call for it? And do the other screeners, will the other screeners that are being used um, pick this up as well? Or does this kind of give um, Terrace Metrics a corner on the market in this area? Um, so yes, the LEAs did request that we bring this to the board for their approval. And um, it, it, because it has the different, it already has different approved screeners, screeners that are already on the approved list comprised within it. It's just basically packaging several different screener tools into one big one so they can do it all at once. Does that let make me, sense? Let me rephrase the question. So spe specifically about the um, substance abuse, the tobacco and substance abuse, is that something the districts are asking for? And can the other screeners that have been approved pick that up? Or would Terrace Metrics be the only one? Um, yes, other districts, the districts could request that um, uh, further substance use screeners be brought to the board for approval. Um, so they would not have a corner on the market per se because other uh, districts could request further tools be brought to you. Go ahead, board member Street. You're still muted. Thank you. So I'm still in my mind, I'm not sure the question was answered. Did the school districts ask for substance abuse to be part of this, specifically to that? May, may I answer that, Chair Hansen? Please. Um, they didn't specifically request for substance use to be added to the mental health conditions, but they did specifically request for terrorist metrics to be considered and they are using the substance use questions currently, which is why they requested us to bring it. Follow up board member straight. Uh, no, sorry. Okay, um, board member Earl. Yeah, um, I I just really would strongly encourage us not to continue to expand these out. Um, these are just a basic screening. We're, I I just would encourage this not to continue to expand these. That's I won't be voting for this. Okay. Any other comments on this one? Are we ready for a vote? I don't see any hands raised, so we'll go ahead and. We're voting now on adding substance abuse as one of the approved mental health conditions for which to screen in the mental health screener. And let's see, Vice Chair Belknap, I didn't see your vote. No. No, okay, looks like we had uh, Board member Cannon in favor and the rest of the committee um, voted no on that one. So that motion fails. So um, we will be taking Terrace Metrics forward to the board um, as a screener for the approved conditions. And then I think um, that adding substance abuse is gonna have to be a future item if we wanna look at that, but that doesn't pass for today. Um, I don't know if we have any Opportunity. Does our meeting cut off, um, Patty, at right at 6 30? I just checked with Jerry Record and he said we could um, do, we could extend it. It is 6 30 and we it was noticed until 6 30. So it depends on if all board members can stay longer. Um, okay. Let me hear from board members. Um, is there, are we okay for another 15 minutes to try to get to this testing? information. We have I, the Perkins I, I state plan, which I believe is a, we heard that last 
time, and, or excuse me, and that one should be fairly um, quick. And then the others are on standard or on standard test administration. Yeah. Anyone who can't stay for 15, raise your, put your thumb down if you can't, Laura. <laughs> we all right? Okay. I don't see anyone. I appreciate everyone working with us. Let's move ahead. Patty, and we'll try to get these next ones, and we'll just have to move quickly. If we have questions that can't be answered, we'll defer these to next month. Okay, Chair so, Hanson, I already have the motions up there, and we'll have uh, uh, Talia come up. Okay, thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Talia Longhurst. I'm the State Director of Career and Technical Education at USB. With me today, I have Wendy Morton, who's one of our CT coordinators. We can hopefully make this relatively quick for you. Let me just set um, a brief context up for you. Perkins is the ongoing federal law around career and technical education. And uh, in 2019, Perkins was reauthorized. We're now in Perkins 5. And uh, a year ago in 2020, uh, right before COVID hit, uh, the board approved our state plan that was filed with the Department of Education. And we've been working under that state plan for the last year. Um, at this point in time, what we're coming today to talk about approval for a change to our performance targets. The baseline targets that we submitted with our plan a year ago was based on data from 2016 through the 2019 school years. Now that we have a full year under the new plan, um, we have our definitions uh, ironed out, we have data collected using those definitions, and we now would like to make some changes to our performance targets. The law requires us to go through the process of approval by the board for those targets targets, and that's really what we're here to talk about today. Some of the targets um, we were able to meet as set by the baseline data and others we were not. And so you'll see in your backup documentation um, what those are. Um, we're happy to answer any questions. That is a really quick down and dirty uh, summary of what we're asking for. What questions can I answer? Any questions from board members? Um, if you had a chance to review the backup material, I think that we've just looked at where we are now and, and had an opportunity to reproject. Um, and Talia informs me that these are safe targets. These aren't necessarily aspirational targets, but these are targets that we feel like are reasonable for the purposes of the, the, propo or the proposal. Um, board member Earl, or excuse me, board member Belknap and then board member Earl. Sorry, to Lee, um, through the chair, to, well, to the chair, sorry. Talia, can these be, um, the Perkins money, has it gone down in the amount that we receive each year? Okay, go ahead. Please. We just received, oh, I'm sorry, thank you. Um, we just received our estimates for next fiscal year, and it actually has gone up a little bit. So I personally, I was expecting to see a decrease given all the things going on right now. But the federal government is spending money, and we are the happy recipients of a little increase. Thank you. And board member Earl. You know what? I, I'm good. I'm good. <laughs> okay. Any other comments or questions on this one? Let's go ahead and vote then. The motion is that the board approve the Utah Perkins 5 revised state performance indicators. Please vote. And we are unanimous there, Nora Lee. Um, all in favor. Thank you. Thanks, Talia. Thank you. We're moving so quickly on that one for us. Next item then um, will be the standard test administration and testing ethics policy. Um, do we, um, and maybe you can help us, Patty, is one of these more important than the other, the parental exclusion and the standard test Six and I, seven. Think they're, I think they're both the same and there's just, just very few changes. And so I, I don't think there were, there's okay. not a lot of anything new, so. Let's dive into number six then, which is the standard test administration and testing ethics. Hello, uh, Jared Wright with uh, test administration and data coordinator at USBE. Um, the 
the both of these, um, Chair Hansen, as, as you mentioned, they're they're somewhat related. Uh, they come before the committee um, each year, so it's an annual thing. Um, for the testing ethics policy, uh, we are just requesting or asking um, to change the effective date of the policy to make it for next year, 2021-2022 school year, and then adding an additional word on page four. Um, and I, I believe it's in the, the backup. I pull it up just to make sure it's, so it would be on page four, it's the fifth bullet down uh, adding the word recording. So uh, it, the, the reason for this is uh, due to COVID, we've had teachers that are trying to support their students. And uh, one of the things that they're asking about or we've heard about is that they're recording them going through the, te um, the test. Now we're not talking summative, we're talking about the benchmarks, the benchmark module for RISE they are recording themselves going through that and or they're wanting to or, or asking about it. And so we've added that to this um, policy of something not to do. We allow teachers to be able to talk with their students about how they perform on those RISE benchmark modules and they can do so on a one-on-one -on -one basis. So they could set up a virtual meeting and be able to talk with the student through that. Um, for those assessments, uh, the benchmark modules, they can actually dig into the questions and see how the student performed and be able to support the student that way. Uh, we are just concerned that we don't want it recorded and then just be out there, but we are allowing teachers to, to talk with students and help them through that to support their learning. Okay, thank you. Do we have any questions about the standard test administration and testing ethics policy uh, that's been revised for the 2021-2022 school year? If not, we'll go ahead and vote. The motion before the committee is that the board approve the standard test administration and testing ethics policy for the 2021 and 2022 school year. Please vote. Looks like that one is unanimous, Norley. I have everyone voting in the affirmative. And we'll move on to the uh, next portion, which I believe is the uh, opt-out form. Is that correct? Number seven. Is that you as well, Jared? Yeah, yes, sorry. Um, okay. Yeah, uh, the opt-out form is, is the usual term, but uh, we're, we're calling it parental exclusion form, I think, in the thing, but yeah, opt out to each of um, So again, two changes here as well. One would be the effective date. So this form would be for next year, 2021, 2022 school year. Uh, if last, well, this is in 2020 with the legislature, they had approved an early mathematics assessment, an associated um, alternate version of that, so an alternate that didn't come to fruition. So this past year, that, that's come through again. And so it's just adding those two assessments, the early mathematics assessment and the alternate version of that assessment to the parental. Those are the, the only changes. Okay. Um, any questions about that? It sounds like we're just updating this one um, for the current year. The legislation that uh, was going to affect this did not go through. Uh, Laura's got a question. Thank you, Chair. So my, my question is, is because uh, I can't see it, I'm, I'm trying to toggle between screens here. Is it an exclusion one? It's not written as a required for graduation. It's just one that parents can check and exclude. Um, I don't know if we can show that on the screen, but it does. It just has a list of all the tests. 
Um, the parents can opt out by checking the boxes um, or initialing on those, but it does say um, for the CTE tests, it does say that these tests are required for licensure or for certification. It's for their certification. And yeah, then it does, it does have some, some uh, disclaimers in there that say, hey, if you it. don't take this test, you could have a problem. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so Chair, one other thing that I just wanted to say, because I know when this is over, it's just gonna go crazy. I would like us to continue to look at options for kids to test online in a proctored setting, rather than having to bring all these kids through a lab. So Jared, I'm just asking. Okay, and I, um, I think, before we vote on this, I think maybe we'll ask um, Jared what is in the works on that online testing because we have had a, some experience with that now and certainly a lot of movement in that direction. Can you just give us a quick update on where things are with that and then we'll, we'll take our vote on this one? Sure. Uh, so where we're at, we continue to move forward right now with RISE. We have benchmark modules that are available to be offered remote. We have been working with our vendor for RISE, Cambium Assessment, who has created some functionality within the system to allow, um, to still use a secure browser, um, but has some other functionality. So we're continuing to move forward. Um, actually, this past uh, week, we've had discussion with uh, an LEA on, on interest in seeing a, um, about online administration, about remote testing. So we're pursuing it. Uh, we're just trying to work through some, some barriers that we have um, that, that we're trying to, to go through. So we're not saying no, we're, we're trying to make sure that we hit all our bases, but we also understand the need to move forward with it. And just a quick one from me, will we need to update board rule to allow for that or does it, um, can we, uh, is that able to be done another way? So, so currently uh, we may need to add a few things to our board rule uh, 277-404, but um, I think, it, I believe it was last spring when we brought it before the committee there were, or the board, there were a few things added, such as third party um, language there uh, to, I think, ad address that. So I think a lot of it, um, that that's what we're trying to get at with um, remote testing is they need to meet those those rules and policies. But with, <clears throat> with where we're going, we may need to update here or there, but um, for the most part, it should be in line with the okay, thank you. We'll be looking for that then to come back to us in the future to, to deal with those issues. Appreciate you sticking with us, Jared. I know we're running late and we're cutting into everyone's Friday night. Let's go ahead and vote on the motion that's before the board, I believe. Did we make this motion? No, no, and we didn't make the last one either, but I figured you made the last one, so you can make this okay. one too. I made the last one. Somebody else want to make this one? I'll make it chair. Okay. Um, I move that the board approve the parental exclusion from for this, yeah, blah, blah, I can't see it. I gotta move this. Parental exclusion from state assessment form for the 2021-22 school year. Okay, the motion before the committee is that the board approve the parental exclusion from state assessment form for the 2021-2022 school year. Committee members, please vote. And looks like we're unanimous on that one. I appreciate everyone sticking around. Um, we had some important things to discuss and I think it is important for us to have dialogue, um, but I know this is Friday night. So thank you for your willingness to hang out with us. Um, and now everybody go out and have some fun. Thanks. Bye chair. Bye everyone. Have a great week. Again. Thank you for the hard work. Appreciate it. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.